quorum of 175 is present. With your permission, we will waive the reading of the constable's return of the warrant. Welcome to Dover's 2014 annual town meeting. While you're getting to your seats, a few preliminaries. The fire chief reminds us that there is no smoking in the building and no sitting in the aisles or on the stairs. Please turn off your cell phones and other devices so that we can all fully concentrate on the business at hand. Three years ago, we had a problem with our PA system because of interaction with cell phones. Please place your cell phone in airplane mode or turn it off. Throughout the auditorium tonight, and as you went to the building, you saw 20 or so residents with name tags and orange bibs on. These individuals have been designated by the town clerk to help ensure the smooth running of tonight's meeting. They wear many hats, checkers, counters, registrars, constables, etc. I have asked the town clerk to give each worker an orange bib to wear so that it will be obvious to everyone in the room who should be in the aisles during a standing count and who should not. As the evening progresses, please follow their instructions and give them your attention as they assist in our voting count. We thank you all for your willingness to work tonight. In addition, the following Dover Boy Scouts are serving as pages. Hayden Brookins, Andrew Mallett, Seth Novich, and Will Sampson. These pages will be responsible for bringing a microphone to anyone in the audience who has been recognized by the moderator. Non-voters and non-residents are welcome to attend our town meeting, but seated in the area designated to my in the town of Nibos, I have asked the registrars to give visitors a name tag indicating their non-voting status. They should be seated in the area designated to my left or in a designated area in the annex. Our guests tonight include our state representative, Denise Garlick. Thank you, Denise, for your service for Dover. As a reminder, you must be recognized by the moderator before speaking. Please raise your hand, and I will try, try to scan the audience so that various locations are equally recognized. We are being televised live. If you are recognized to speak, please either proceed to a microphone or directly into it. The powers which you are being beyond. Now, says Edmund Cautions. I'm Jeremy Dadra, moderator for the town. Mic close to your mouth and speak directly into it. The power switch will already be on. Now for some introductions. I'm Jim Rapetti, the moderator for the town of Dover, and in that role will oversee tonight's proceedings. On your left, my right, we have the town administrator, David Ramsey, members of the board of selectmen, Robin Hunter, Carol Lisbon, and Jim Dolly, the chair, town clerk, Barry Clough, the, the assistant town moderator, David Haviland, and town council, William Leahy. On your right, my left, we have John Cohn, the chair of the Warren Committee, Robert Cox, James Stewart, Rich Forte, Doug Lawrence, Kathy Gilbody, Brooks Gurnard, and Jeffrey Miller, all members of the Warren Committee. A few words on procedure and tradition. We conduct our meetings according to a tradition peculiar to the New England called town meeting that has evolved compiled and updated by a committee of the Massachusetts Moderators Association. Although similar to Robert's we use is a volume called Time, compiled and updated by a committee of the Massachusetts Moderators Association. Although similar to Robert's rules, this volume varies from that strict guide for parliamentary bodies. While Robert's rule is a useful reference, it does not govern our meeting. Although our tradition does embody numerous thou shalt and thou shalt nots, much is left to local custom and to the moderator's discretion. At the end of the day, whether you have won or lost on a particular issue, it is very important that you feel the process has been fair and consistent with our tradition. Important because this really is the glue that holds this most democratic form of governance together. It is a fragile thing, this town meeting tradition. Too many rules and it will become a game only lawyers can participate in. Too loose and it becomes anarchy. I would like to provide a... The main motion is that which is stated by the Warren meeting terms and bylaws. This has been received well in the past, so tonight I will do it again. The main motion. The main motion is that which is stated by the Warren committee at the beginning of the committee to do an article 
or by a citizen in the case of an article sponsored by a citizen. Now, most motions require a majority vote to pass in what quantum two-thirds or even a three-quarters vote to pass. The quantum end vote is based on the subject matter of the motion on before or before the vote is taken, what quantum is required. Amendment to the main motion. An amendment to the main motion must be discussed and voted on before returning to the main motion. A majority vote is required to amend any motion. If a voter desires to amend a motion, it will require that the amendment be put in writing and to be delivered to the podium at the time it is put on the floor. Move the question. This motion is often yelled out by a board frustrated town meeting, meeting attendee who just wants to get on with the vote on a particular article. I will not recognize that motion, or any other for that matter, which is yelled out. You must first be recognized, and your motion must then be seconded. At that point, there is no debate allowed on a motion to move the question, and we will vote immediately. The motion to move the question requires a two-thirds vote to pass. Assuming that motion passes, the meeting will move directly to the vote on the motion which was previously before and is made within 30 minutes of the vote on a motion to main motion. Reconsider a motion. Dover's bylaws state that if a reconsideration motion is made within 30 minutes of the vote on a motion to be reconsidered, only a simple majority is required to pass the motion to reconsider. Otherwise, this motion requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, the lesson that has been learned from those with experience with reconsideration motions in the past. Do not leave the town meeting until it has adjourned. Your favorite article is always at risk for reconsideration, and it has happened here in the past many times. Motion to dissolve. Finally, a motion to dissolve takes privilege over all other motions, is not debatable, and requires a majority vote. As a rule, we use voice votes, and this is consistent with the tradition of if seven or more voters immediately question the moderator's call on a voice vote, then I'm, I am required to ask for a standing count. Hopefully, I have not confused you with this quick review. I am here to help you accomplish with this all parameters the serious business, and I am required to ask for a standing count. Hopefully, I have not confused you with this quick review. I am here to help you accomplish with certain parameters the serious business of the town. If you are confused, please always feel free to ask for clarification. Before each article, I will state the subject matter of the article and then recognize a member of the Warren Committee to make a motion on the article. The full text of each of these articles is printed in the Blue Book, and in most cases, uh, the Blue Book includes a summary of uh, understands why the Warren Court Committee voted the way they did. If you did not bring your Blue Book with you tonight, please raise your hand and a print page will bring you one. Does everybody have a copy of the blue book? Okay, very good. A word about brevity. Tonight I will require that presenters of articles limit their presentations to no more than 10 minutes. During the discussion of these articles, I will try to maintain a balance between moving the agenda along and ensuring that all who have something to contribute have the opportunity. With these articles, I will try to maintain a balance between moving the agenda along and remind speakers that the longer that all who have something to contribute have the opportunity. We have a fair amount to cover tonight. I encourage brevity and remind speakers that the longer and more complex your presentation, the greater the chance that you will confuse rather than persuade. Hopefully, all who wish to, all who wish to will have the opportunity to speak, and we'll, we will reach a vote without someone having to move the question out of boredom or frustration. It would be nice if we can avoid having to continue our meeting to tomorrow evening. A couple more reminders. If I am to in a standing count is, or stand up to be counted, do not move around the hall during the counting procedure. I will have to halt the count if I see someone not wearing an orange bib in an aisle during a standing count during the counting procedure. I will have to halt the counting if I see someone not wearing an orange bib or in an aisle during a standing count. In order to ensure a correct count, each section of the he or she will be asking each row to sit counter as please pay attention to the counter for your section. In a particularly crowded section, uh, like the wings here, he or she will be asking each row to sit down after it has been counted. The counters of each section then confer and agree on the number before it is recorded by the supervisor. 
The supervisors agree on the total count and subsequently bring it to the podium where I double check the total vote count. I am confident that this procedure ensures a correct vote count. Finally, I ask that all attendees tonight remember that emotions and personalities should be left at the door of the town meeting. I will not tolerate emotional outbursts or accusations directed towards individuals or groups. But it is imperative that we disagree without being disagreed of democracy. Let us honor the memory of all those who sacrificed to give us this great gift of democracy by conducting ourselves in a professional manner. Are there any questions about procedure? All those who sacrificed to give us this great gift of democracy by conducting ourselves in a professional manner. Thanks to the scores of elected and appointed volunteers who comprise our town government, as well as the able employees who ensure the smooth running of the town. In particular, I would like to thank the scores of elected and appointed volunteers who comprise our town government, as well as the able employees who ensure the smooth running of the town. In particular, I would like to thank Barry Clough, our town clerk, who is stepping down for many years as our very capable clerk. Thank you, Barry, and all the others who ably serve our town. Tonight, I would also like to especially remember Dover citizens who have contributed to Dover governance, Joseph Milken and Henry Simulant. Um, we mourn the passing of these neighbors, and we are grateful for the difference they made in the life of this town. Democracy is a wonderful prize that has been preserved through the sacrifice and effort of millions of our citizens. Let us take a moment to silently recognize those who are fighting to protect our freedom and putting themselves in harm's way at this very moment in service of our country. A moment of silence, please. Thank you, and may God bless America. Before we begin tonight, please. Thank you, and may God bless America. Before we begin tonight's proceedings, it is customary to recognize the Chairman of the Warren Committee for a few remarks. Mr. Cohn. Thank you, Mr. Rapetti. On the Massachusetts.gov website, there is a document put together by the Department of Revenue entitled, A Guide to Financial Support for Budgeting and Finance Issues. I'd like to quote the opening paragraph of the section titled, Role of the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee is the official fiscal watchdog for a town. Because it is difficult for all taxpayers to be completely informed of the town's finances, finance committees were established so a representative group of taxpayers could conduct a thorough review of municipal finance questions on behalf of all citizens. The Warren Committee, Dover's name for the Finance Committee, is empowered and obligated to dig into all aspects of the town's budget. And uh, quite frankly, we do so with gusto. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all town employees and committees and boards that have presented their budgets and uh, quite frankly, would do so with gusto. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all town employees and committees and boards that have presented their budgets to us and have consistently responded to our questions and our requests for additional information with professionalism and patience and good cheer. Thank you to all those people who have uh, come before the Warren Committee. Here's another sentence from the role of the Finance Committee. The primary duties of a finance committee is the finance. Uh, and here we are tonight. The Warren Committee's recommendations are just that, recommendations for your consideration. But before we begin considering and voting on the articles, I'd like to say a few words about the process and the people on the Warren Committee. I believe an effective town finance committee will be comprised of a group that is representative of the town at large, is open-minded and fair-minded to all those who present, can dig into the details while keeping the big picture in mind, and can be respectful of one another's opinions, especially in those cases where thoughtful people reach different conclusions. I believe the Town of Dover's Warren Committee is representative of the town at large, has been open-minded, especially in those cases where thoughtful people reach different conclusions. I believe the Town of Dover's Warren Committee is representative of the town at large, has been open-minded and fair-minded to all who present it, has researched the details of the budget, and has remained cordial and mutually respectful throughout the months leading to town meeting. And most important, because of their dedication and responsiveness, they have made my role as chair of the Warren Committee easy. And I thank you one and all for that uh, hard work. Finally, I'd like to make a comment on our responses to your review and all the details of every budget before making our recommendations. And we do study the budget details in preparation for town meeting. But invariably, questions are asked that require us to go back to the budget details to give you a proper response. 
particularly for some of the salary and expense line items, lines in Article 4. Many of those individual numbers, uh, behind many of those individual numbers, single numbers, are often many pages of detail that are just summarized by the one number. So questions and comments are, many of those individual, at least have a little patience, it takes us a moment to be sure of our response of detail that are just summarized by the one number. So questions and comments are, um, but please have a little patience, it takes us a moment to be sure of our response. I'd now like to introduce James Stewart, who will give you a brief overview of town finances to set the stage for our meeting tonight. James is the current vice chair of the Warrant Committee and has prepared the overview for both open hearing and town meeting for the last three years. James. Make it a little more clear. I'm going to take, I'm going to, uh, take you through the summary of the budget, and uh, I have a pointer here to try to make it a little more clear. Um, it should take just a couple of minutes. There's about 18 slides or so. Uh, for fiscal year 2015, we're proposing uh, a budget here of uh, $34,733,000 uh, versus last year's of $33,440,000. The increase is one about $1.3 million, or about 3.9%. The uh, total revenues that are being projected, uh, which also um, exclude the use of free cash, uh, are uh, 33 million 216. The uh, total revenues that are being projected, uh, which also um, exclude the use of free cash, uh, are uh, 33 million 216 thousand dollars versus last year's 32 million. The increase is about 1 million 8 thousand dollars, or 3.1 percent. Um, the total use of free cash that we're uh, proposing here is about $1.5 million. Um, um, big picture, the uh, Article 4 is where most of the operating art items are. Um, the big, about 5%. Um, big picture, the uh, Article 4 is where most of the operating art items are. Um, the big increases are um, primarily about $400,000 for the regional schools operating assessment. It's up about 4%. The uh, Dover School operating budget, which also includes out-of-district spending for special education, is about $408,000 up, or about 4.5%. There's a decrease, um, and a big one, in this year's budget. It, uh, for group health insurance, which is in the insurance and pensions item, is actually down by $144,000, or 7.2% this year. It's a rare thing, and in my experience, that hasn't happened. Um, but it's happening this year, this next year. Um, capital items for fiscal year 15, which also include special articles here, um, is about $420,000 um, building proposal, um, article percent, and that's driven largely by the um, uh, the, uh, the protection building proposal um, article item to uh, 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 that. These items here explain about $1.1 million of the overall increase of about 1.3, and um, that's the bulk of, of, of the change. Next. This slide shows a summary of the um, budget components. And so you see Article 4, as usual, is, is the large, uh, almost 90% of the items um, in the total budget, debt service, is about 4.5 percent. That's down from previous years. Um, it was 4.9, I believe, last year. Um, special articles, um, capital items. Uh, the reserve fund is is uh, what we uh, reserve. Uh, it's about $250,000. What we reserve for unexpected items uh, during the year that that might additional to, to addition to overlay from the assessors and other um, uh, assessments. Next, miscellaneous items include special. This uh, slide is an additional shows the revenue sources and expenditures, and you have a copy of it in, in the blue book. Um, and uh, on the top is revenue sources, on the bottom is the expenditures. This uh, slide um, shows the revenues um, of these items uh, from year to year. Um, so you can see that the um, revenue items uh, total, uh, including changes um, of these items uh, from year to year. Um, so you can see that the um, revenue items uh, total, uh, including um, the use of free cash, and uh, right now the expectation is about 1.5 million of free cash will be used. Um, and uh, you know this is all largely self-explanatory. Uh, next, 
Uh, this slide uh, is a is sort of a summary of Article 4 items that's also in the Blue Book, and it shows by heading um, what some of the big uh, trends are in terms. Of, and uh, you can see the um, regional schools and teen, and then the requested amount for fiscal year 15, and the changes and the differences. And uh, you can see the. Um, regional schools and the Dover School operating and the pensions that I mentioned, um, that includes insurance, so um, insurance is up, so we don't see a big drop there. Um, and uh, you see, see all the other items, um, but I think I've covered most of the big ones. Next slide, please. And this one's just a bigger, in case you couldn't see the numbers, uh, just a bigger presentation of, of the big change. Um, and so I'll slip. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows the spending by category in a pie chart. Um, the, uh, you can see that Dover schools operating is about 30 percent. The regional school is about 30 percent. Insurance and pension takes up about uh, 10 percent of the uh, Article 4 um, with uh, the general government, which is the running of essentially the townhouse plus some building maintenance. Debt service is about 7 percent. Um, of the Article 4, Health and Sanitation 1.5, and Highway. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows, um, and it just trends, it sort of gives you time, and uh, you can see the different uh, departments and the changes, um, and it just helps to sort of give you a sense of the, size, the relative size and changes over time, and you can see that a lot of the big increases have come from the schools. Um, over time, and uh, most of these other items <clears throat> are relatively flat. Highways up about five percent. Next slide. Uh, looking at the other side of the house, the estimated revenue um, about of of the total of thirty four point seven million, uh, about eighty percent is tax levy. Um, uh, new growth is expected to be about 1%, or projected to be about 1%. The use of free cash is about 4.4%. And uh, there's some state aid uh, local receipts, which um, uh, uh, is about 2 million, projected to be about 2 million, and debt exclusion. That gives you a sense of where our revenues come from. Next slide. And this uh, breaks that down over time. And you can see some of the big changes and the the, the tax levy is clearly the lion's share, and it's up by, um, it's projected to be up by about 4.1 percent, which uh, includes the uh, Proposition 2.5 limit, plus also the new growth. That's how you get to the 4.1 percent, and you can see that it's actually um, relatively stable from previous years. Next. Uh, that brings us to the overall budget. In this pie chart, compare the revenue to the expenses and the gap is to be filled with free cash. And again, the total amount of free cash that we're um, projecting uh, to use uh, subject to this meeting is $1.517 um, million. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows a usage of free cash as a percentage of the total overall expenses. And uh, the free cash is essentially the, the, the town's savings account, um, which gets certified every year on June 30, uh, by June 30th and uh, by the state. And um, it essentially uh, enables us to um, uh, plug the gap that, we, that, we just spoke of, that I just spoke about. And um, this year we're projecting to use about, um, our, our budget gap is about 4.4% of expenses, and that's in line with where it's been in previous years, um, in previous uh, recent years. Next. Uh, there's been questions at uh, previous uh, town meetings and previous uh, uh, open hearings about uh, the share of budget for, for the schools, which it's, it's, it's a quite substantial amount. Um, and uh, the way things work in Dover is um, certain things are, are allocated differently and between the uh, regional school and the local school. And so it's hard to get, a, a, um, without doing some analysis, it's hard to get a, uh, a, a, a true sense of what the percentage we're actually spending on the schools are. But um, we've done an analysis here, and um, I'll go through this relatively quickly. If you need 
if you'd like to look at it further, it's um, on the website from the open hearing. Um, but we uh, took the operating capital expenses and debt expenses and made adjustments. And the next slide, please. Um, and there's adjustments for health insurance. Um, the region, they pay for the teacher's health insurance. That's in their budget. But the uh, Chickering schools, teachers are um, Dover and town employees, and that's not in the Chickering budget. Um, and there's some questions, uh, there's some differences in debt payments. Next slide. So get to the bottom line. Um, there's also some adjustments in circuit breaker and state aid. Um, next. And we get to a pie chart. Um, uh, school, schools are approximately 64% of the total budget. And the non-school budget is about 36%. And um, there's, again, as I said, details in the open uh, the warrant open hearing. Um, and so that, that number is, I think, represents a, a, a it's still a significant um, number, but it's, uh, it's uh, less than some of the ones that I'd heard uh, bandied about in previous years. Next. Um, that concludes the overview. Uh, hopefully um, this plus the uh, blue book uh, you found uh, helpful and instructive. Thanks. Thank you, James. At this time, it is also customary to recognize the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Dolly. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'll be brief, and I do not have any slides. <laughs> On behalf of the Board of Selectmen, we'd like to thank you for all attending this year's town meeting. The Warren articles before you are the result of thousands of hours of work by your fellow citizens who volunteer as appointed or elected officials on numerous boards and committees and in dedicated work by our town employees. Thank you all who helped govern Dover. We also would like to remember Joe Melikin, who recently passed away. Joe served the town of Dover for 16 years, including serving as a selectman with Carol and I. We miss him and God bless him. Of the non-recurring warrant articles this evening, the Board of Selectmen will be presenting and commenting on Article 11, the renovation of the dispatch area and the protective agencies building, Article 15, which is the region's capital budget request, and Article 16, the Mintman School Regional Agreement. While not on this evening's agenda, I would, likely, I would like to briefly discuss the recent notification about a possible 40B affordable housing project on Springdale Avenue. On April 4th, the Board of Selectmen received the notice pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 61A, that the owner of 46 Springdale Ave had entered into a purchase and sales agreement to sell 27.2 acres to Northland Residential Corporation. The contemplated development of the property would be 40 plus townhouses, of which 25% would be deemed affordable. This right of refusal is a result of the homeowner applying for and receiving a Chapter 61A real estate tax exemption for certain farming use of the land on 24 acres of that parcel. Under state statute, the town of Dover has the right of first refusal to purchase this parcel, which must, which must be exercised within 120 days of the notice, <coughs> excuse me, which is August 2nd, 2014. We had over 50 citizens attend our selectman meeting on April 17th when Northland explained the project and concerned citizens asked questions. The town website has been updated to include the facts as we know them now and a list of questions and answers if available. You can also sign up for email notifications of changes to the web page so you can more easily keep informed of new information. We will continue to work diligently serving the town during the process of deciding on the town's first right refusal. And please be assured that nothing will be official until a town meeting is held. Also, within the first 30 days, the state statute allows the town to review the purchase and sale to ascertain whether or not the notice given to the town is in compliance. After a careful review, the Board of Selectmen on April 30th decided to accept the notice as is while outlining the statutory deficiencies and continued the due diligence. I would like to remind everyone of the upcoming town elections on May, Monday, May 19th, as noted in the Blue Book, Article 23. 
The article lists the open elected office positions. Lastly, I urge our townspeople to either continue to participate or if you haven't participated, step forward, volunteer your time, or get involved in one of the many issues currently at hand by sharing your opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Before we move to the articles on the warrant, it is customary to again recognize the chairman of the warrant committee for a motion governing the conduct of the meeting. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator, I move that the following rule be adopted for the conduct of this meeting. Any amendment to a main, to a main motion that would increase an appropriation must contain a provision for the source of funds for the increase such that the total amount to be raised and appropriated at the meeting will not be increased. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Stewart has second. seconded. This is a motion that requires that uh, if somebody wants to make an amendment that would increase spending, they have to identify a source that would fund that additional spending. Is there any discussion on this motion? Okay, this is a majority vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We will now begin with the art articles that are contained in the blue book, starting with Article 1. This first article pertains to annual reports and is submitted by the selectmen. Mr. Moderator. Mr. Cohn. Yeah, Mr. Cohn. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, I move that the reading of the various reports by the town clerk be waived and the reports be accepted and placed on file. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Stewart seconds. Before we go into this, let me just make one uh, comment. I am aware that some questions have arisen about whether Parks and Recreation submitted a report of its revolving fund. Parks and Recreation did submit on a timely basis a copy of a report on their revolving fund. Uh, it is on the town web and also a copy of that has been distributed at a town meeting for your, your examination. Unfortunately, the printed annual report inadvertently omitted a copy of the revolving fund, uh, but it is available on the web and is also available as a handout. Is there any discussion on this motion to accept the town reports? Okay, this is a majority vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 2 relates to real estate tax exemptions for veterans, disabled veterans, blind persons, and persons over 70 years of age and certain other individuals. It is submitted by the Board of Assessors. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town accept Section 4 of Chapter 73 of the Acts of 1986 as amended by Chapter 126 of the Acts of 1988 for the fiscal year 2015. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Stewart has second. Any discussion? Okay. This is a majority vote. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, town salaries for our elected officials, Article 3. Mr. Cohn? Mr. Moderator, I move that the salaries recommended for elected officials of the town, as shown in the right hand column of the Warrant Committee report, be called over by the moderator, and, if, and that if no objection is raised to any of them, they be approved as read. Second? Second. Mr. Stewart has seconded. The motion uh, has been moved and seconded that I read the salaries on page 30 of the Blue Book for Article 3. If this motion passes, I will read the salaries and put on hold those items that are rejected to, which we will then consider individually. All items that have not been objected to, as I'm reading them, will be deemed to have been approved. Are there any questions on this motion? Again, the motion directs me to read the salaries. Any salaries not objected to are deemed to have been approved. This is a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. I will now read the salaries on page 30 of the blue book. You can follow along if you like. One, Board of a Selectman. Chairman, $200. Clerk. 150. Other member, 100. Assessors, chairman, 400. Other members each, 350. 
Number three, town clerk, $49,376. Number four, planning board, chairman, $100. Other members each, $50. Number five, constables for three, $150 each. Number six, board of health, chairman, $150. Other members, $100. Are there any holds? Not hearing holds, these salaries are deemed to be approved pursuant to the motion that we adopted. Okay, Article 4. Article 4 relates to the salaries for town employees and also the expenditures of the town departments. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Moderator, I move that the salaries and expenses recommended by the departments, officers, boards, and committees of the town is shown in the FY 2015 requested column in the warrant committee report be called over by the moderator and if no objection is made that the town appropriate such sums and raise such amounts from the tax levy and from other general revenues of the town except that ten thousand four hundred thirty four hundred dollars at thirty six cents of the amount appropriated pursuant to line item 710 therein for maturing debt principles shall be transferred from the Title V receipt reserved for appropriation account. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Cohn. The motion has been made and seconded. This is just like the last article. If you approve this motion, I will read the budget items beginning on page 31 of the Blue Book for Article 4. If you have a question, simply say hold as I read a particular line item and we will go back at the end to discuss it. Items for which no hold is voiced will be deemed to have been approved. This is a majority vote. Any questions on this motion? Again, this is to direct me to read the items for Article 4 beginning on page 31. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, if you turn to page 31 of the Blue Book, We'll start with uh, number 301, moderator, zero. As I said last year, you get what you pay for. <laughs> 131, warrant committee, $7,680. Okay, I have a hold on 131, warrant committee. Uh, number 122, selectman, total, three hundred forty five thousand one hundred three dollars number one nine two town house, house expenses sixty thousand one hundred thirty four dollars one ninety one Whiting Road four thousand seven hundred thirty four dollars one ninety three Carroll Community Center one hundred ten thousand six hundred eighty four dollars 199 building maintenance total three hundred three thousand two hundred seventy dollars 129 copy postage thirty thousand four hundred dollars 151 law one hundred ninety thousand dollars 135 town accountant total hundred eighty five thousand nine hundred twelve dollars 141 assessor total hundred fifty nine thousand seven hundred forty five dollars 145 treasurer collector total two hundred eight thousand seven hundred seventy three dollars 155 data processing sorry did was there a hold on um, 145 no okay uh, 155 data processing total, $131,607. 161 town clerk total, $73,736. 162 election registration, $55,102. 175 planning board total, $61,135. 411 engineering total $58,803. 
201 police, total $1,884,097. Protective agency building, number 299, the amount is $88,235. 292, animal control, total $28,436. 220 fire, a total $446,736. 231 ambulance, total $170,056. 241 building inspector, total $85,967. 291 emergency management, total $3,460. 171, Conservation Commission, total $63,431. 176, Board of Appeals, total $3,685. 294, Care of Trees, total $98,811. 295, Tree Committee, $2,500. 433, garbage disposal, $18,800. 439, solid waste, total $385,121. 450, town water, total $26,760. 519, board of health, total $71,824. Highway and bridges, total $709,621. 423, snow and ice, $344,000. 424, street lighting, $12,297. 425, town garage, $78,371. 428, Tarvia patching, $250,000. 194, energy coordinator, zero. 491, cemetery, total, $107,800. 541, council on aging, total, $134,142. 610, library, Total $568,782. 650 Parks and Recreation, total $406,936. 152 Personnel Committee, zero. 178 Dover Housing Partnership, zero. 195 Town Report, $11,509. $543 Veterans, <coughs> $2,000. 691 Historic Commission, $1,250. 692 Memorial Day, $2,700. 912 Workers' Compensation, $62,025. 914 Group Insurance, $1,862,458. Okay, hold on number 914, group insurance. 916, Medicare FICA, $153,746. 191697 dollars Hold on number 950, other insurance. 911, Norfolk County Retirement, $829,039. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 9-11, Norfolk County Retirement, $929,039. Schools, six, number 600, Dover School Operations, $9,510,262. Okay, hold on, number 600, Dover School Operating. Number 601, Dover's share of regional operating assessment, Total, $10,467,496. Number 
Number 602, Minuteman Vocational, $37,798. 604, Norfolk County Agricultural High School, $6,000. Number 710, Maturing Debt Principal, $1,160,400. Seven five one maturing debt instrument. Sorry, seven five one maturing debt interest, two hundred sixty three thousand two hundred dollars. Seven five nine bank charges four thousand dollars. Okay, I've heard a hold. Just to go back to the beginning, on number one thirty one, the Warren Committee. Number. 914, group insurance. Number 950, other insurance. Number 600, Dover School operating. Were there any other holds? Okay, we, we'll now consider these one at a time, and I'll be entertaining motions for each of these items so that we'll have an individual vote on each of the items for which there was a hold. Mr. Stewart? Mr. Moderator, I move that. Mr. Moderator, I move that $7,680 be raised and appropriated for the warrant committee line item number 131. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Stewart has moved and Mr. Cohn has seconded that we approve the uh, appropriation of $7,680 to the Warren Committee, number 131 at page 31 of the Blue Book. Discussion? Uh, would the gentleman who uh, asked for the hold, would you like to speak to this matter? Uh, could you state your name, please, and your address? I'm sorry, the microphone doesn't seem to be on. Mr. Moderator. Thank you. John Jeffries, Meeting House Hill. Just a quick question to the Warrant Commission. Why the 48.26% increase? Thank you, sir. Mr. Cohn? Sure. There are only uh, two items in the Warrant Committee budget, um, and that's the uh, publication of the Blue Book and um, the, um, um, the, uh, the fee to belong to the membership fee to belong to the Mass uh, Association of, of Financial, um, Massachusetts Municipal Association of Financial Committees. And that's the 180 piece. And for many years, we've budgeted $5,000 for the publication of the Blue Book. Um, we've actually gone over that budget in the last few years. We should have addressed this in a more gradual sense a few years ago, to be honest. Um, we want to, the, the uh, cost of the publication of the Blue Book is dependent upon the number of copies and essentially the number of pages. It, it may be a little bit more than that. So in a year where we have, um, we happen to have um, an unusually high number or higher number of articles that go into additional pages, it costs more. So we have an estimate there. Um, the, the increase uh, to $7,500 essentially for the printing of the uh, Blue Book will allow us to handle uh, costs that we've actually been incurring the last few years. It will also allow us to perhaps uh, expand somewhat on the exhibits and, and make um, the Blue Book a bit more informative in terms of the information that we pass along before everyone gets to town meeting. But that's, that's the source of the increase was the uh, cost of the Blue Book. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cohn. Are there any further questions? Okay, a motion has been made to approve the appropriation of $7,680 for the Warrant Committee. It's been seconded. This is a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The next item for which there was a hold is uh, on page 39 of the Blue Book, item number 914, group insurance, uh, involving an appropriation of $1,862,458.
Mr. Stewart, could I ask you for a motion, please? Mr. Moderator, I move that one. With it, one million eight hundred sixty-two thousand four hundred fifty-eight dollars be raised and appropriated for item number nine fourteen. Group insurance. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Over there, uh, Mr. Smith. Peter Smith, Pond Street. Um, at the open hearing on the warrant, a question came up about funding of the other post-employment benefits fund, and nobody had the numbers handy at that meeting. I did some research subsequently, and I found to my pleasure that the town has continued to add annually to this fund um, since the end of the MTBE settlement money came in. And I'd like to, first of all, commend the selectmen for keeping their eye on the ball and not letting this future liability drop. Um, I do have two questions. Is first, is there any money in the budget this year um, for that? And second of all, um, are we following a formula to guide our annual contributions? Carol, would you like to? Uh, Anybody on the Warren Committee want to address that? So, <laughs> Um, yes, the OPEB funding is based on a number that's provided to us from our actuarial service that looks at this. And um, I think next year, every three years, you have to do a, a, a totally new actuarial look. So we expect to have that number uh, maybe change a little bit for fiscal year 16. But right now it's based upon our, the information given to us by our consultant. And the, um, and the budget number in total is going down because we've taken a look at our health insurance uh, premiums in, in real time uh, from um, West Suburban Health Group, which is a consortium of towns around uh, uh, Metro West. And uh, given the history of the premiums and the subsidies that uh, West Suburban is providing, we thought that we could decrease the health insurance number. So those are basically the two numbers that make up the group insurance. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Is there any further discussion? Okay, this is a majority vote. All in favor of the appropriation for group insurance, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The next item uh, is number 950, also on page 39, other insurance involving an appropriation of $191,697. Um, could I ask the person who asked for the hold to? Uh, Mr. Fleming, right. Oh, I'm sorry. First, Mr. Fleming, let me make the motion. Could I have a motion with respect to number 950, other insurance in the amount of $191,697? Mr. Moderator, I move that $191,697 be raised and appropriated for item number 950, other insurance. Okay, thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. And now, uh, Mr. Fleming? Jim Fleming, Fox on Road. Uh, I'd like to hear what's included in other insurance. And does this include, where is uh, unemployment compensation included? And if it's included in there, can we be told where the unemployment is being generated from? A uh, question has come up about the unemployment insurance. Do the Board of Selectmen know? All right, all right, David, would you like to comment on that? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Unemployment insurance is not under other insurance. It's separately funded under another warrant article. This year we are currently requesting no funds for that. What's included in the other insurance? Property casualty, mm -hmm. police and fire accident, and EMT accident insurance. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ramsey, and thank you, Mr. Fleming. Are there any further questions? Okay, this is also a majority vote. Uh, again, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the 
appropriation of uh, $191,697 for other insurance. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The last item for which there was a hold is item number 600 on page 39 for the Dover School operating budget. The appropriation amount is $9,510,262. Mr. Stewart, could I have a motion with respect to this item? Mr. Moderator, I move that $9,510,262 be raised and appropriated for item number 600, Dover, uh, Dover School Operating. Can I hear a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Stewart has made the motion and Mr. Cohn has seconded. Um, is there any discussion on this matter? Over here. Uh, right down here, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, Bob Springett, uh, 28 Francis Street. I've heard for some time now that um, the, the enrollment at Chickering has been going down, but the budget number has been growing and that it's been driven primarily by increasing costs for added district special education students. Um, if I have the numbers right from the blue book, it looks like we spend about $16,400 per in-district uh, students and about 64,000 net of circuit breaker reimbursement for out of district uh, special education placements. Uh, so really, I'd like to know, is the town either alone or in collaboration with other towns or the school committees in either alone or in collaboration with other school committees or other state uh, organizations like collaboratives or the Mass Association of School Superintendents, uh, are anyone or any of these organizations doing anything to take this, what looks like blatant sort of discrimination in our spending um, that results from the state funding uh, formula for this mandated service? I have no problem with the service itself. Is anybody doing anything to try to change the funding formula so that it is more equitable for towns like Dover? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Springer. Uh, maybe, maybe the superintendent would like to speak to that. <coughs> thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Bliss, superintendent of schools. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Mr. Springer. We appreciate it, and it's certainly something that we wrestle with. Uh, in meeting the needs of all of our students in the school system. We have 2,146 students system-wide, and of course a number of our students do require specialized educational services. I would like to say that on a local level within the school, we're doing as much as we can, and we continue to look for uh, other options and opportunities for students, including developing specialized programs with under the, under the roof of Chickering, so that we're able to make a cogent argument to be able to keep students in district as opposed to having a number of students placed out of district. In addition, I'm pleased to say that Denise Gar Representative Denise Garlick and I have met, and there is a, a pretty uh, concerted effort at the state level to increase the circuit breaker reimbursement formula that's applicable to all uh, 382 public school districts across the Commonwealth. So we hope to be the recipient of a fully funded model that would realize between 70 and 75 percent of a circuit breaker reimbursement. So as the economy improves, we've seen some improvement on that front as well. And in case in point, in the town of Dover for fiscal year 15, we anticipate circuit breaker reimbursement in the neighborhood of about $700,000. So when you look at out of, out of district costs, you want to make sure you're also backing that out as well. But please be mindful of the fact that we're doing our level best in the schools to make sure that we're providing a free and appropriate public education in what's called the least restrictive environment for all of our students. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Any uh, further discussion? Any further questions? Okay, a motion has been made and a, a seconded to approve the appropriation of $9,510,262 for item number 600, Dover School Operating. This is also a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion also carries unanimously. Okay, Article 5, the capital budget. Mr. Cox. 
Mr. Moderator, I move that the following sums recommended for the various capital purposes be called over by the moderator and, if no objection is made, that the town raise and appropriate such sums unless another funding source is noted and that any sums realized from the trade-in or auction of old equipment shall be used to reduce the cost of the acquisition of new equipment or to purchase related accessories. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cox. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, a uh, motion has been made by Mr. Cox and seconded by Mr. Stewart. Like the prior motions, this one directs me to read over the capital budget items to see if anyone objects to a specific item. Unlike the prior two motions, I will not be reading from the blue book. Rather, I will be reading from the motion itself. The blue book at pages 41 to 49, however, follows the same order as the motion. I will read slowly so that you can follow along in the blue book. Number one, cemetery, hearse carriage house renovation, zero. Number two, highway department, a one-ton truck with plow, H16, $56,640. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, talking about a deer in the headlights. I forgot that the motion's been made and seconded for me to read, but I forgot to ask you to vote on it. Is there any, is there any discussion of, of the motion which will enable me to start reading again? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? None. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, again, I will be reading um, items there summarized in the blue book beginning at page 41 through page 49. And let me start again. Uh, number one, cemetery, hearse carriage house renovation zero. Number two, highway department, A, one ton truck with plow, H16, $56,640. B, slide and sander, H3, $15,550. Number three, library, A, technology hardware, $7,000. Number four, park and recreation commission, A, large tractor mower, $36,000. Hold on number four, A, large tractor mower. 4B, girls softball field, zero. Number five, police department, A, patrol vehicle, $36,500. B, live scan fingerprint machine, $19,285. Hold on 5B, live scan fingerprint machine. Number six, school committee, A, concrete repairs, to front and rear slabs, $13,000. B, light emitting diode, LED, site lighting upgrade, $15,641. Hold on number 6B, the light emitting diode, site lighting upgrade. 6C, complete security upgrade, $7,156. 6D, gym block and ceiling painting, $16,745. 6E, gym wood floor refinishing, $14,625. 6F, energy management system, EMS, major upgrade, $22,950. G, floor burnisher, $6,767. H, technology hardware for grades four and five pilot program, $30,540. I, technology hardware for grades two and three pilot program, $11,583. J, technology hardware, laptops, $25,700. Number seven, selectmen. Carroll Community Center, Air conditioning for new council on aging, COA space, $15,000. B, Carroll Community Center, rehabilitation of two public rest rooms, <coughs> zero. Okay, I've heard holds with respect to 4A, large tractor mower for parks and recreation. 5B, 
for the police department, live scan, fingerprint machine for $19,285, and for 6B, school committee, light emitting diode, LED, site lighting upgrade. Are there, were there any other holes? Okay, as with the other motions, the items that were not held are deemed approved and we'll now go back and reconsider each of these items individually. First, with respect to um, item four, Parks and Recreation Commission, large tractor mower for $36,000. Um, could I have a motion, Mr. Cox? Mr. Moderator, I move that the sum of $36,000 be raised and appropriated for item 4A, Park and Recreation Commission, large tractor slash mower. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded to approve for Parks and Recreation, a large tractor mower for 36,000, item 4A. Any discussion? Uh, gentleman who had the hold, um, do you have a question or a comment in the back there? Yeah, Peter Jordan, 145 Dedham Street. And I'd just like a clarification because this mower is I guess six years old, and I was looking later down on in the warrant for at the um, uh, school committee asking to replace a tractor from 1989 uh, that's 26 for $26,000. And what, it, what struck me was the school committee could manage with a tractor that was uh, going on in years, and uh, the, the park committee, park and recs, needs a uh, new tractor every six years, and uh, it just seems a little I just like clarification I to understand how come they get worn out so fast. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, maybe I could ask somebody from Parks and Recreation to comment on that. Uh, Ms. Sims, would you like to comment on that? Could you? Uh, could we have a page, please, uh, for Nancy Sims? She's in the front here. Uh, hi, I'm Nancy Sims. I'm one of the Park and Rec Commissioners, uh, 6 Sanger Circle in Dover. Park and Rec had requested to replace this tractor last year. We had been on a five-year cycle um, and had had, uh, our experience had suggested that tractors needed to be replaced every five years because beyond that, um, our maintenance expenses increased significantly. Last year, the Capital Budget Committee asked us to wait a year and to revisit that experience. Um, we did, uh, and it turned out to be an economical decision, so this year we are replacing um, that tractor. Is that sufficient? Okay. Um, they do wear out quite a bit. Um, they do get a lot of use. They're used to maintain not only the athletic fields, but also the uh, town common area, the library, some of the um, park land along the streets. Um, and they are maintained diligently, but they do wear out. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you, sir, and thank you, uh, Ms. Sims. Any other questions on this motion to appropriate $36,000 for a large tractor mower, item number 4A for parks and recreation? Okay, over here, uh, can I have a page right here? Thank you. Uh, Karen McCoy, 26 Farm Street. I have a tractor and it's about 30 years old. Um, do you have any data in terms of the number of hours on the tractors and what the annual maintenance costs are? Because mine are minimal and I use it a lot too. Do you have any data on what the total hours of use on the tractor are? Because that helps to maintain, to know what its lifespan is and what the annual maintenance costs are. Because there are many tractors which are decades old, which are still in operation. Uh, can I have a page here for Ms. Sims? Please, a microphone. Karen, thank you for that question. I don't have with me the uh, maintenance expense that we've incurred on that tractor for this past year, nor for its um, six-year life. I know that information exists, and I can get it for you. Um, I suspect there's also um, the in data that documents the number of hours that it's used. And I'm sorry I don't have that for you. It's a great question. <coughs> Mr. Moderator, if I may? Yeah. I, I have the detail that Park and Rec did provide so, oh, if I may, for Ms. Sims. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Lisman. Go ahead. 
the uh, trade in value uh, for fiscal year 14 um, had the capital budget committee uh, recommended that last year was $12,800. The trade in value of fiscal 15 is $10,000. So the trade-in has decreased by $2,800 off the bat. The maintenance that was incurred in fiscal year 14 this current year because we did not recommend approval was $1,400. So the cost of delaying the year is a um, $4,200 gross. I don't know what the additional cost of the mower was itself. But Karen, I hope that answers more of your question. Thank you, Ms. Lisbon. We have a question over here. Again, right, uh, bring the microphone down, please. Mr. Springett. Hi, uh, Bob Springett. Um, I'm chairman of the Capital Budget Committee this year. Um, the Capital Budget Committee has been working with all the town departments in terms of vehicles and technology replacements to make sure that we have an agreed amount of sort of, of metrics around usage, whether it be uh, years in the case of police cars, mileage, or hours used. Now, it's not perfect yet. We've been just doing this the last couple of years. I've inherited a lot of this work from predecessors. So we are working very hard to make sure that we have the right metrics in place to, make, to ensure that we are replacing these things on an appropriate schedule, not just a program. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? OK, motion is to approve appropriation of 36,000 for item 4A, large tractor mower for parks and recreation. This is a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion carries. The uh, next hold was for 5B with the police department, live scan fingerprint machine, an appropriation amount of $19,285. Could I have a motion, please? Mr. Moderator. I move that the sum of $19,285 be raised and appropriated for item 5B, Police Department Live Scan Fingerprint Machine, uh, and that any sums realized from the trade-in or auction of old equipment be used to reduce the cost of acquisition of new equipment or to purchase related accessories. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Okay, again, uh, same drill as before. We'll be considering the appropriation of $19,285 for the live scan fingerprint machine. Any discussion? Uh, gentleman who had a hold, okay, thank you. Mr. Moderator, John Jeffries, Meeting House Hill. Uh, $19,000 for a live scan fingerprint machine that assumingly would replace the ink and the paper process, et cetera. Uh, relative to the, to the um, request, it says the uh, process no longer meets standards, police, proto uh, police protocols. What exactly are the stand what changes are being made? What's the timeline for the standards? And what would happen when the live scan machine doesn't work? I I'm assuming you'd go back to the paper and ink process. For the past 28 years, I I've been a managing director at a securities firm and have had the privilege of being fingerprinted many, many times okay. in a process that works extremely well. $19,000 for a live scan machine. Okay, thank you. Let me, uh, Mr. Mc uh, Chief McGowan, would you like to comment on this? Peter McGowan, Police Chief, Town of Dover. The uh, live scan fingerprint machine, the fingerprints, uh, the old cards and ink that we're currently using have been deemed as unacceptable by the Department of Defense. They will not accept uh, paper cards anymore, and it's looking like the FBI is going in that way as well. The live scan machine will allow us immediate um, acceptance of the print, let us know if it's good or not. Right now, if we take a, a card, print now, send it in, and it's not up to standards or not readable by whomever we're sending it to standards, it gets sent back. A lot of times with an arrest, we don't have the ability to take the prints over. If we're doing a town employee, we have several town employees that come in for their jobs. If we have to take their prints over, that's easy. We call them up, come on in. Kind of hard to track down some of the people that we otherwise fingerprint. Um, we're anticipating the Department of Defense and FBI all going towards this electronic acceptance of the um, fingerprint cards. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, any further discussion? 
Okay, motion is to approve the appropriation. Oh, another, okay. Please stand, thank you. Christine Montesano, 8 Church Street. I'm curious to know how many people you uh, fingerprint per year. And if it's possible to use in other towns. Chief, do you want to respond to that? Thank you. Mr. Moderator? Yes, sir. We average approximately 80 custodies a year. In addition to that, we have um, protective custodies on top of that. And then we average somewhere in the area of five to eight residents a month come in needing fingerprints for securities and that type of jobs. So I would put us somewhere in the area of 125 to 150 per year. We cannot currently use other uh, live scan machines. Several towns around us have it, but it's programmed specifically for that town. Okay, thank you, Ms. Montesano, and thank you, Chief McGowan. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, uh, again, this is a majority vote on the approval of the um, appropriation of $19,285 for item 5B, the live scan fingerprint machine. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The last hold was for 6B um, for the school committee, the light emitting diode LED site lighting upgrade in the amount of $15,641. Uh, could I ask for a motion, please? Mr. Moderator, I move that the sum of $15,641 be raised and appropriated for item number 6B, school committee, light emitting diode, LED, site lighting upgrade, and that any sums realized from the trade-in or auction of old equipment be used to reduce the cost of the acquisition of new equipment or to purchase related accessories. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. So we have a motion now, um, and it has been seconded with respect to item 6B, the LED upgrade in the amount of $15,641. Discussion, please. Uh, question. Yes, Mr. Sims. Can I have a page here? Thank you. Uh, why don't we wait, Jamie, because you need the uh, microphone for the um, television. Plus, I'm a little hard of hearing. Jamie Sims, uh, Six Sanger Circle. This is just a fundamental question about is this a gotta have or a nice to have because I've recently gone through an analysis of my own business with regard to large scale exterior LED lighting and the conclusion was is that the, matur the maturity of the technology is still a ways off and the prices might come down precipitously. So I was curious as to whether or not this was a, uh, a really important project that needed to be done. It's not a big dollar amount, but still. Okay. Um, Press, uh, Mr. Superintendent, would you like to address this? Mr. Moderator, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sims, thank you for your question. This is actually the conclusion of a three-year campaign to replace some of the light fixtures around the Chickering campus. Uh, this concludes at an ATM uh, 13. We actually requested $5,427. Uh, this appropriation would call for the replacement of four wall packs around the building, the exterior of the building, uh, replacement of one light fixture in a, on a pole in the rear of the building, four fixtures on poles in the main lot, and the replacement of 1270-watt uh, light fixtures along the walkway to the main lot. So this is a must-have in our estimation this year. Thank, thank you. Thank Smart you, Dr. Dr. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, motion. Oh, oh, okay, Mr. Clark right here. Sorry, it's hard for me to see, so I appreciate it. Thank you for waving. Gerald Clark, Valley Road. Uh, several questions. Uh, just a clarification. Uh, number one, since you mentioned the light bollards that are going to be included in this package, uh, the bollards, that is to say the small stanchions that sit along the walkway, uh, one of the big problems with those has historically been the fact that none of them seem to last more than about a year before there's vandalism that destroys them, and I'm just curious if you could deal with that question of are, is there going to be a better way to protect those so that the investment isn't lost so quickly. But number two, and this is more a, not just a question for the school committee, but I'd like to put it on the floor. Uh, having just gone through the relamping of an entire very large nonprofit organization, 
uh, to the tune of about almost $110,000, and having it all paid by NSTAR, including the installation, through those fees that all of us pay in our monthly electrical bill. I'm just curious if the school committee has ever approached NSTAR on the energy saving program, and I put to the town and its administrators the thought that in the future, any lighting conversions or improvements that can be done, that there is a substantial opportunity to see to the use of the NSTAR energy saving program. And if you consider it, I would urge you to think about asking towards the end of the year, because I discovered that historically NSTAR tends not to spend all that they have collected, and then as they get to the end of the year are under the obligation to spend it quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, would you like to address that, Dr. Bliss? Thank you, Mr. Clark. I appreciate the question. Uh, with respect to the security, I will certainly um, consult with Mr. Ralph Kelly as to the security for those walkway fixtures. I do, I do, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and in terms of energy rebates, we actually just underwent a comprehensive assessment at one of our other campuses. It happens to be at Pine Hill, and because that is our, our one of our older buildings, obviously. And we, in fact, engaged NSTAR and have realized in the neighborhood of 13 to 15 percent utility savings, we certainly will be doing the same research for Chickering, particularly as our building ages. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Bliss, and thank you, Mr. Clark. Any further questions or discussion? Okay, the motion is to approve the appropriation of $15,641 for item 6B. This is a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, Article 6, the Unemployment Fund. Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move this, that this article be dismissed. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Forte has seconded. Uh, this is a motion to dismiss Article 6. Is there any discussion? This is a majority vote. All those in favor of the motion to dismiss, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 7, accumulated sick leave. Mr. Forte. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $10,000 for the purpose of payment of accumulated sick leave for retired police officers as authorized by Chapter 375 of the Acts of 1984. Thank you, Mr. Forte. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Lawrence has seconded. It has been moved and seconded to have $10,000 be raised and appropriated for accumulated sick leave for retired police officers. This is a majority vote. Any discussion? Okay, no, no discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> Thank you. Article 8, Highway Funds. Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into contracts, apply for, accept, extend, and borrow in anticipation of any funds allotted by the Commonwealth for the construction, reconstruction, and other improvements of town roads and related infrastructure. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Forte and Mr. Lawrence. Motion has been made and second, seconded. Basically, this motion permits the Board of Selectmen to access funds from the state that may be available for road construction and repair. This is a majority vote. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 9, revolving funds. Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Moderator, I move that pursuant to the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 53, E and a half, the town authorize the use of revolving fund accounts for the following boards or departments, and that such accounts shall not exceed the amount set forth for the fiscal year 2015. Number one, building department. Number one A, gas inspector, $6,500. Number one B, plumbing inspector, $16,900. Number one C, 
wiring inspector, $24,000. Number two, Board of Health, number 2A. Perk and deep hole inspecting and permitting, $40,000. Number 2B, septic inspection and permitting, $40,000. Number 2C, well inspection and permitting, $15,000. Number 2D, swimming pool inspection and permitting, $10,000. Number 3, library. Number 3A, materials replacement, $5,000. Number 4, Council on Aging. Number 4A, Senior Activities and Transportation, $14,000. And further, that the fees charged for these services be credited to the respective accounts and that the aforementioned boards or departments be authorized to make expenditures from the respective accounts and therefore respective purposes up to the amount set forth above. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Forte has a second. Is there any discussion with respect to this motion on revolving funds? Okay, no discussion. This is a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 10, revaluation. Mr. Merrill. Mr. Moderator. I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $40,000 for the reevaluation of all property in Dover to be conducted under the supervision of the Board of Assessors. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Cox has seconded. Motion has been made to raise and appropriate $40,000 for reevaluation of Dover. Any discussion? This is also a majority vote. No discussion. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 11, renovations of the dispatch area in the protective agency's building. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $455,000 for the purpose of design and construction to renovate the dispatch area in the protective agency's building. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Do I hear a second? Second. Mrs. Gurnett has seconded. Thank you. Any discussion on this motion with respect to the renovation of the dispatch area in the protective agency building? Uh, Robin, would you like to um, discuss this? Thank you. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll get to you, Mr. Springer, in a second. Okay. 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 Good evening, everyone. Robin Hunter, 32 Cedar Hill Road in Dover, and also a member of the, can you hear me? <laughs> of, of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, tonight, the Chief and I uh, have prepared a brief um, presentation on what we believe are the needs to reconfigure the protective agency building. This may sound a little familiar to some of you because we have been down this path once before, but I thought it might be wise to go over some of the history. So in 1998, the building was renovated, and that renovation actually added bays to the current building and some office space, but it did not in any way upgrade the um, dispatch area, which is the area that we are currently looking to have upgraded. In 2008, and I'm dating myself because I was chair of the Warren Committee back then, we actually approved a feasibility study for the town to evaluate the workflow of the dispatch area and determine whether or not a reconfiguration was necessary, and if so, what would the cost be? In 2010, after putting together the feasibility study and having open hearings, 
it was brought to town meeting, and at that time it was approved at town meeting by a very slim majority, and then failed at the polls. In 2010, when Chief Griffin retired and Chief McGowan came on board, um, he asked to put it on hold so that he could evaluate how the workflow was getting done and whether or not he also felt that this renovation was necessary. There have been some concerns about the process that we've undergone with respect to this renovation. We do not and did not have a building committee. In the town of Dover, we typically haven't done this for renovations of existing space and items for which we're not requesting capital exclusions. However, this project has been vetted by many citizens in the town of Dover. We worked with the police chief, we worked with capital budgets, as well as the Warren Committee. We spent numerous hours meeting with the architects to go over the cost estimates. <coughs> I spent four hours of my time at two open houses hoping that citizens would come and see for themselves how dysfunctional the space is. And unfortunately, all I got were two visitors. So um, I am hoping that in this brief presentation, you know, we will be able to convey to all of you here tonight at town meeting that there is a need to reconfigure the space. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. I'd like to give an overview of the dispatch uh, facility and what it does. Dispatch serves as communication center for all emergency, v all emergency calls in Dover. We handle police calls, fire calls, ambulance and EMS calls, and dispatch go through us, uh, highway department, and mutual aid for surrounding towns, as well as statewide callouts. Dispatch is also an after hours point of contact for all town boards and committees uh, after normal business hours. For volume, since 1975, when it was originally installed, our call volumes are up by 53%. The town's bigger, more people live here, there's more traffic, there's more activity, so we're up by 53%. And dispatchers in, in dispatch monitor 23 different radio, uh, radio channels and frequencies that are programmed into the console <laughs> at the workstation, in addition to <coughs> five telephone lines and all walk-in traffic coming in the door. Technology has increased and improved over the last 40 years, such as enhanced 911, the criminal justice information system, CGIS, um, the registry of motor vehicles and other types, they all add to the burden, space burden, time, and attention of the dispatch officers. Here you see a current floor plan. As you see, it's confusing because you have two entry points left and right. The waiting area walks right into the big open area. Uh, if you stand at the front counter at the lobby, you've got a front row seat for everything that's going on in our department. Um, <laughs> there's no separation between dispatch and the lobby area, there's no separation between dispatch <coughs> and the back area where the police officers do their business in the back. Um, you can see that there's no privacy um, and our internal traffic patterns are difficult. Please. The current configuration, as I said, is one big open area, uh, three separate functions. The waiting area for people who come in, uh, dispatch area and roll call and information sharing going on in the back. Our issues are that there's no separation between the lobby and dispatch areas, which means no privacy. Um, if you're in there with a question or a comment or a problem or a concern, whoever else happens to be at the front door is going to know your problems. While you're waiting, you're sitting there listening to whatever's going on in town, whether it be a phone call or a 911 or a medical call or any other type of issue, there's no privacy whatsoever. And it also contributes to a lack of confidentiality and security throughout. Just to give you an idea of a regular day, we took some semi-candid photos. If you could run through these, you can see a dispatch area fills up. Um, waiting room is up front. Uh, the main dispatch area is here. And we have uh, workstations throughout for the officers. Roll call is in the back um, while whatever is going on in dispatch is going on. These three separate areas have a waiting area, dispatch, and shift changes. To fix it, the fix will be um, to segregate dispatch into an enclosed area so the dispatcher can focus on the task at hand. Um, it's, it's a very um, stressful job. There's very much attention to detail. If we miss a phone number, if we miss an address, it could be life or death. 
It'll separate, seg uh, segregate dispatch into um, one area, functionality of workflow, and we're also going to improve energy efficiency. The windows that were put in 40 years ago, single pane glass both in the front and up top, they're, they're leaking, they're whistling, they're, the gaskets are hanging down. Um, I can guarantee you energy efficient savings based on this. As you can see, the proposed layout will, will uh, eliminate one door and have all traffic come in through one area. It'll segregate a waiting area, so if you're coming in to speak to an officer or you have to um, have any, t any of your own business with us, there'll be a, f a front waiting area with a lobby to talk to the dispatcher. Um, basically a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can see you have a, a walk-through or a pass-through window to the dispatch area. Um, we'll have the office support and the roll call area segregated from dispatch in the back. It'll increase our functionality. And again, the, the energy efficiency will be an added benefit. Why is this so expensive, people may ask. Um, first of all, we are using the existing footprint. We did get estimates from an architect and um, certified estimators to determine what, what the cost would be for our reconfiguration. I think it's important to understand that the cost is a budget and just like every, every municipal bid, we will go out to bid for this project. We also need experts and that's what the $75,000 um, cost is. It's the cost of specialists, HVAC people, um, and some other specialists. And then dispatch is essential to police, fire, EMT. So we have to relocate the dispatch area while we are renovating the current area. And there's an additional cost of $30,000 for that. Additionally, you know, it, we can't use the same contractors that all of us use in our homes. We need contractors that are certified to do municipal work, which requires that they're paid prevailing wage, which is a union wage, and typically that runs about 10% higher than normal contractors. So that's another factor for the increase in cost. Are we going to battle on who's going to do this? Doing great. <laughs> okay. You know, the question is, you know, why why do we need this change? We really the way the department functions, if you spent any time there, you will know that it just doesn't work. It's very noisy. I don't know how the dispatch officers are actually able to pay attention with all the other commotion going on. I've spent quite a bit of time there recently and you do, you can't help but listen in to the calls that come over. And Dover is a really small town, and you know who the ambulance, whose house the ambulance went to. And those are some of the things, you know, we, privacy is really important. Also, since the area is going to be completely renovated, it made sense for us to also add some of these energy conservation items so in the long run we could save on efficiencies and operations. And you can... We also want to make sure that the modernization is done retaining the small town feel. So if you have to talk to a police officer, you come in and you talk to a police officer. It's not going to be uh, an intercom system. It's not going to be a uh, some departments are going to a TV screen and you talk back and forth like that. Um, the next screen, please. The space was last updated in 1975, which is 40 years ago. Um, we as a town need to invest in our assets in order to maintain them. Investment and asset maintenance will retain value and ultimately save, as we said. Oh, so how are we going to pay for this? So um, we have a special article, this is Article 11 that we're discussing right now. Um, we, do, we are not doing a debt exclusion. This is actually part of the capital budgets, but due to the size, we pu pulled it out as a separate warrant article. This is very similar to the warrant article two years ago for the fire truck. This is essential to the way the police and fire and EMT operate and they need, we need to give the professionals that we hire the tools that they need to function 
properly. And you know, we feel very strongly that this is a need to have and not a nice to have. So there will be no vote. Tonight is town meeting vote. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. And we hope that we've been able to convey to you the need for this reconfiguration. Thank you, Chief McGowan and uh, Mrs. Hunter. Uh, could I ask you a quick question? When you, you meant to say that there'll be no ballot vote. Okay, um, so the, the, the vote will be a town meeting, but there will not be a subsequent ballot vote. Okay, well, thank you. Um, any discussion, any questions, comments? Uh, there's a hand in the back. Um, Justine, uh, pay, uh, could you have a microphone? Could the page give? Sure. Yeah, Justine, Kent Uritam, Haven Street. I'm going to take you at your word, Jim, that you say the town meeting is a deliberative session. Okay. So I hope there will be some debate about this. I appreciate very much all that Robin has done and the police chief. However, I guess I have a very different view on this. Um, there have been other incidents in our town where we've done building renovations, where we have had building uh, committees, whether it was the town garage, whether it was the Carroll School and trying to figure out whether to renovate it as a community center or to build new. My tradition in Dover, going back to the 70s when I moved here, was for all important uh, capital items like this, there would be a committee. I consider 455000 a lot of money. Maybe some of you don't, but I do. I think it's worthy, number one, of a committee. As much as I think the selectmen and the warrant committee, uh, folks that advise the police chief have worked on this, you're probably talking, I don't know, 25 people. Here tonight, we barely have, what, 175 people. And frankly, one other problem I have with this process, besides the lack of the building committee, is the fact we aren't going to a ballot. As you may recall, uh, with the fire truck, I also considered, I voted against that too, because it did not have a ballot exclusion. Each time different uh, eyes look at a project of this magnitude, in my opinion, you get a better and better and better decision because you're bringing in a wider group of people. I have to laugh because I think probably half the people in this town make their living off of finance or real estate or construction, so I can't imagine there wouldn't be difficulty in paneling a building committee to look at this to see, A, if it's needed. It may well be. I certainly would agree with you on the energy efficiency. And secondly, if the cost is reasonable. <laughs> and I, unlike many other uh, committees that the selectmen have in panels, such as the uh, bicycle Committee, uh, the Board of Health with their Lyme Disease Committee, other committees, there's been a reaching out to the public. And I think in this case, it's been a uh, sort of an inside game. Um, the reason it can be sort of an inside game, and I think many of you have been in town government, so you know this, is uh, we have already been taxed through our property taxes um, uh, uh, an amount that's about 5.6 million that the Warrant Committee uh, is dispensing tonight with your help, if you vote yes, on many of these capital items that you've heard about. This would be another capital item. That 5.6 million will be going down to whatever, approximately 4 million or so, if you vote for the police station. But I think uh, that money, since it is our money, <laughs> the taxpayer's money, should actually be voted upon by the taxpayer for a big ticket item. And I do consider this a big ticket item. So uh, if you recall, some of you were here last year for town meeting. There are an awful lot more people then. And that was all about transparency and about getting a lot of people involved in the process. Um, as you recall, there was a, an extensive debate at town meeting about uh, private funding for artificial turf fields, and there was a vote on that, and then it was followed several weeks later, not quite the same 
uh, vote, but on the same topic, by 40% of the town showing up at an election. I'm not sure this particular article would get 40% of the town out, but I think it'd get an awful lot more than us here tonight. So I'd urge you to vote down Article 11 because of process. And if the selectmen want me to be on a building committee for it, I'd be more than happy to do it. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if I could ask you to please hold your applause so that we can continue the discussion. Um, uh, Ms. Hunt, Ms. Hunter, would you like to respond to that? Justine, thank you for your comments. Um, first of all, we did embark upon a process. Um, I think it, this project has really been vetted. The feasibility study has been looked at very, very carefully. I think it's, we have some really hard working people on capital budgets and the Warren Committee who have gone and spent many, many hours making sure that A, the costs for this project are appropriate, making sure that there was a need for this project. I think it, we also as a town have publicized on our website in the newspapers, asking people to come to the police station if they couldn't make out open houses. The police chief, I know, gave some private tours to citizens that couldn't <coughs> make out two open houses. You know, we have been completely transparent. All of the Capital Budget Committee's meetings are, are posted and are public, as are the Warrant Committee meetings. We've, we had a, provided a similar presentation at the open hearing. I, you know, we, we got no feedback um, from the town, but I think the process we went through was a good one, and I hope we've been able to convey the need for this. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Hunter. Uh, any further discussion, questions, comments? Yes, sir. Can I have, uh, you can come up to the mic if you like. And Farm Street and my objection uh, to this article is I'd like to pick up a little bit on what uh, Justine said and I don't know whether I'm going to offer a, an amendment or what but uh, let me get to what's bothering me it's more how the issue is being uh, presented to the voters or to be precise how many voters it's not being presented to and that would be, as Justine pointed out, that we generally get a whole lot more people at the election, uh, voting on the election ballot than we get here. Um, four years ago, if you don't know what the figures are, I looked it up. It was 51% in favor, 49% opposed here. 248 people voted, 127 to 121 at town meeting. A town election, the vote was 22% in favor, 78% opposed. About 800 people voted. So you can see that the number opposed was more in the area of 500 plus people opposed and I think 200 and something um, in favor when it came to the election. So the moral of the story as far as I'm concerned is that you don't always get at town meeting an accurate reading of what the uh, voters feel. On police and fire issues, it's often said that the reason for this is that people don't want to get up and speak against the fire department, speak against the police department. We're going to need them when we get a uh, difficult situation <coughs> at home, a fire, a police matter, something like that. We want to make sure they're on our side. We don't want to speak against anything that um, uh, you know, impacts the, might impact them in a negative way. So I guess what I'm saying is that we've had the experience of having this issue come before town meeting and then come before the election. And it clearly showed that the election had a very different view than town meeting. And so I was expecting that when this came up again this year, we would get the same kind of thing. We would get the opportunity to vote for this at the election 
um, in addition to town meeting. Apparently that can't happen this year because it's too late to put it on the ballot. So I guess what I'm asking or would like to ask is that we send a message to the town that when we have a big ticket item, and particularly when there's an example that the town felt very differently on the same issue previously, that we give the whole town, that we give the voters a chance to uh, get a shot at this. So what I'm suggesting is, I don't know if there's a way to amend this to, to get to that uh, same point, but if there's no way to amend it, I'd like to ask that we vote it down for this year, bring it back next year on both the town meeting and the town election, and let's go at the merits. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Keefe. Yes. Okay, I uh, have Paige come down. We have two people down here who would like, right. Oh, would you like to come to the front? Please come on down. Hi, I'm Amelia Slosby. I'm on Normandy Road. And I would just argue that everyone got this in the mail and everyone had a chance to read it. And if you felt strongly against it, you could be here tonight and vote on it. I think that I understand the argument, but if people really feel strongly, they have the chance to vote here. This is a chance to give their voice. And people who are not here are choosing not to have their voice heard. Uh, please hold the applause, please. Uh, Ma'am, would you also like to talk to the issue? Uh, can I have a page, please? Right up here in the front. Wait, please. Um, Kristen Dennison, Springdale Avenue, and I would actually concur with what Amelia said in terms of we have the right to vote, this has been well publicized, and if people felt strongly, we come to town meeting to exercise our, our privilege. I'm still, and I don't know if you can get into this detail, I am a little shocked that it's $375,000 for a relatively small space. Um, is there any chance that there is cost cutting that could be done around this issue? Are we, you know, can we cheap out on our countertops and our flooring? Um, it just seems like a lot of money for a really small space, and I fully understand the privacy issues. So that's my hey, other uh, question. Ms. Mrs. Hunter, thank you. Mrs. Hunter, would you like to respond to that question, or Chief McGowan? This, again, is our budget, and um, in municipal accounting, things have to be funded, so you have to be really careful to ensure that your budget is going to cover the actual costs. And um, we are going to go out to bid. The guidance that we gave the cost estimators was to do things as cost effectively as we could, but at the same time to meet all the requirements that we have. I realize it's, it's expensive, and um, actually the, the architect is right here, and it's very difficult for any of us to, to understand why these costs are so much more expensive than for the same space in your home. It is a small space, but a lot has to go into it. Again, we have prevail prevailing wage. We have um, certified specialists that, whose, ha whose assistance we also need, and then relocating the, um, the, the actual dispatch area. So, uh, you know, this is a budget, and hopefully our goal is to beat the budget, but at the same time, we want to make sure that things get done properly. Okay, Mr. Thank Mills, do you have anything to add? Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Hunter. Uh, Mr. Cohn? Uh, I, I just thought it appropriate um, to comment on behalf of the Warren Committee that uh, it was a, uh, we, we considered it, we discussed it at length, we met with the, the architect as well as, uh, as looked at the space, and, and we were uh, unanimously in support of, uh, of this article, of the renovation, um, and uh, I wish more people had taken advantage of the open house, and I'm, I'm going to say one thing. Bear, bear in mind, this is space that has been open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, week after week, decade after decade, for 40 years. Um, and people who have gone and visited and then seen in person what's going on, people have a very strong reaction, oh, yes, I get it. 
Um, and the other point, this is a, it, it is a significant amount of money, and uh, I think we all believe strongly that every, every, every penny, every dollar we spend out of, you know, taxpayers' dollars, and we're all taxpayers, um, it's important to keep an eye on it. But it's also 1.3 percent, 1.3 percent of the fiscal year 2015 budget. Um, so, and at this town meeting with just, you know, this brave few, um, we are basically approving uh, $34 million and, and, and expenditures for fiscal year 2015. If the frustration is that we're not getting enough people at town meeting, we should all work harder on that in the coming years. But just to, to <coughs> use this particular article, um, sort of as a whipping post to, you know, sort of gin up, uh, um, you know, more interest or more participation time. Well, you know, it seems a little bit uh, inappropriate. But uh, we were in un unanimous support. Um, we do feel a lot of the frustration that, you know, why aren't more of our neighbors here tonight? Uh, but this is the this is the process. This is the setting. This is the way we go about making financial decisions uh, at, at town meeting here in New England. And yeah, we should have more people here, but. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady waving her hand about four rows right here. Thank you. And then I saw two others over on the left. We'll get to you, thank you. Thank you. Maureen Dilge, Brook Road. Um, I'm not sure whether you, the citizens of Dover know, but in the uh, police station, is a workout room. And the citizens, the senior citizens in Dover are allowed to use that workout room three mornings a week. I've been going to the police station for the past two years, three mornings a week, working out. And this is not only a money issue, this is also a privacy issue. As I walk in to the police station in the morning, I see the dispatcher there working She's taken phone calls. She's on her computer. The officers are sitting in the background working away. As I walk through, I can hear their conversations. I can hear her on the phone. I can hear her talking to Dover residents, my neighbors. And they're talking about things that I should not be listening to. It's not any of my business. But I hear it because she is on the phone and she has to speak to them. What the officers do now is when I walk through, they look at me, they say, hi, Maureen, I say hi, and they immediately don't say anything else. They stop talking because they know that I can hear what they're saying. I appreciate that they do this. So yes, $455,000, yeah, that's a lot of money, I agree. But I think my privacy, and I think the privacy of the Dover citizens are much more important than paying $455,000. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lady in the back next to the exit sign. Right behind you, there you go. Hi, I'm uh, Heather Hodgson, um, 77 Main Street. And um, I truly am here because of Justine, who reached out. And I too <coughs> recall the vote a few years ago with this. And I have been to the police station many a times, and I am a, a friend of the police. Um, I agree with the points that yes, there could be some changes. Um, I do agree that there are, I'm sure, privacy issues. I also know I have a police scanner, and I can hear things too that goes on from my own private home. But I agree with Justine in the sense that this is a process, and when this came in front of the town, if we couldn't make it to town meeting, because I have a young child, okay? If I look around the room, I see the people I grew up here with. I don't see the people with the young children who can't make it to town meeting. And I was under the assumption that this would have come in front of the town at the election as it did last time. And that's the only reason why I'm here. So whatever your process is, whatever, your, whatever it is, I agree with the cops in our town that they need their privacy, but I also agree with Justine, and she is the reason I'm here, and thank you very much. Okay, there's a, a gentleman behind you in the first row. 
Ken King, Pine Street. If this article passes, what will be this impact on personnel and will there be additional uh, people required on the police department? And if so, what will be the annual cost uh, addition? Thank you. Uh, Chief McGowan, would you like to respond to that? Sir, thank you for the question. I should have included that. There is no additional staffing or other costs involved other than the costs that are presented before you tonight. Mr. Thorndike? Uh, uh, sir, uh, could I have one of the scouts bring a, a microphone down to Mr. Thorndike? He's right over here, right towards the front in this wing. Thank you. I'm uh, so pleased to hear that the uh, building has gone so well for these 40 odd years because uh, I used to sit where you are, Mr. Moderator, and uh, appointed that building committee, and I'm very proud that it's worked out so well. So I move the question. <laughs> a motion has been made to move the question. It is not debatable, and it requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of moving the question, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, let us turn to the motion. The motion is to approve the appropriation of the sum of $455,000 for the purpose of design and construction to renovate the dispatch area in the protective agency's building. All those in favor, please say, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, this, uh, it, the, it, this is, the motion is not debatable uh, at this point. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries, majority vote. Thank you very much. Article 12. Moderator. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay, the motion has been made for reconsideration. It is obviously within 30 minutes of, uh, of our vote. So that will be a majority vote. Um, is there any discussion of the motion for reconsideration? Uh, Justine, do you, oh no, okay. No, you can't. No, you, no, you can't. I'm sorry, the rules don't permit a reconsideration of a reconsideration. Okay, so um, this will be a majority vote on the motion to reconsider the article that we just voted on. All those in favor of reconsideration, please say aye. All those opposed? No. The nays have it. The motion for reconsideration is denied. <coughs> now you see why it's important to stay at town meeting after the motion is voted on. And I remind you that this, uh, there will be other articles that we may also have to uh, consider, reconsider. So please stay throughout the meeting. And I would also like to compliment everybody on the high level of their discussion. Uh, you really, all of you, even though expressing different views, but everybody did the town very proud. Thank you very much for that high level of discussion. Article 12 is the amendment to the Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Mr. Cox. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town amend Section 181 of the Wetlands Protection Bylaw of the Code of the Town of Dover by adding and deleting text in Sections 181-1 181 2, 181-3, 181-4, 181-5, 181-6, 181-7, 181-10, 181-11, and 181-13, as shown in a document which has been placed on file with the town clerk and has been made available as a handout at town meeting except that the underlined portions and the interlineations are shown to indicate additions and deletions, respectively, to the current bylaw text for illustrative purposes only and will not appear as underlining or interlineations in the bylaw as amended by this motion. 
and further that non-substantive changes to the numbering of this bylaw are authorized in order to make numbering conform to the numbering format of the code of the town of Dover. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Do I hear a second? A second. Uh, Mr. Merrill has seconded. Motion has been made to amend and wetland the protections bylaws. Uh, I'd like to call on Kate Flockner from the Conservation Commission to discuss this. Thank you very much. I hope this won't be uh, nearly as exciting as the last article. Uh, just to give you some historical background, Massachusetts which is actually the first state in the country to have a Wetlands Protection Act. It was first passed in 1972. Um, and it was the first to acknowledge that water was important for many resources. The actual enforcement of that act is generally done by the 351 conservation commission that are around the state. Um, in Dover, our conservation commission was established in 1986 by the Wetlands Protection Bylaw. It's, the bylaw has been revised in 1994, and now, nearly 18 years later, we've decided it's time to update it again because citizens and members of the commission noticed that there were small discrepancies that were um, creeping in or um, it wasn't clear what the process was. We had a series of open um, hearings to both look at the bylaw and then the rules and regulations which are authorized by the bylaw and which contain kind of the day-to-day -day workings of the commission. And you do have a copy on the table as you came in of the, com of the complete bylaw with the alterations. So it's important for you to know that all of the changes are technical in nature. There are no substantive changes to any of the definitions. There will be no difference in what is a wetland as defined in Dover. These are things that are more in terms of uh, promoting consistency and clarity. There are seven major areas, if we go to the next slide. So in terms of transparency, an example would be that we took the word aesthetics out as um, a criteria that the commission uses to judge a, proj a project because we didn't feel that could be supported. Um, they simplify the bylaw. As it currently stands, there are some definitions um, that are in the bylaw and other definitions that are in the rules and regulations. We move them all to the rules and regulations so that people wouldn't have to look at two documents when they came in front of the commission. They modernize procedure. Abutters are always required um, to have notification of a project on a property that's near them. And um, it was certified mailing, and now the post office offers a lot cheaper ways of notifying abutters that would be accepted and are actually encouraged by the state. And also, Massachusetts has um, passed the Rivers Protection Act. The original wetlands protection didn't have anything to say about rivers. And, in, um, and so we've incorporated those changes into the bylaw. The next. We tried to clarify the processes. For instance, every time that we gave um, a time frame, we now have a start and a finish to that time frame so that it's quite clear. And we also specified exactly how long <coughs> each approval is um, good for. There was a discrepancy before where the bylaws said one thing and the rules and regs said another. They, we're trying to simplify the application process. Um, for instance, right now the bylaw has a list of things that are required for application. The rules and regulations have another list. Again, like the definitions, we moved everything to one place so it would be easier for um, citizens. And there were a couple of just simple Scribner's errors that had crept in when it, the, uh, when it went digital. <coughs> so we asked respectfully for approval of the amendments. Um, we, the approval of the bylaw amendments will make them very consistent with our rules and regulations. Our goal, again, is not to change the nature or enforcement of the wetlands, but to promote the clarity and transparency and consistency so that the commission is able to work more easily with the citizens of the town. And we're open for questions at this point. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Um, could you block that for me, please? 
Thank you. <laughs> Truly a deer in the headlights. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Feiner. Are there any questions? Uh, back in the left here, can I have a uh, right to your right? There you go. George Murphy, 12 Hartford Street. Uh, two questions. First, I just want to compliment the Conservation Commission for all the fine work they do in protecting our ecosystems and, and wetlands here in Dover, which mean an awful lot to the folks who live here, obviously. The first question has to do with something you pointed out, which was omission of the word aesthetics. Uh, I did a little research to figure out if aesthetics should mean anything in terms of, of the purpose of wetland protection and the Conservation Committee. And what surprised me uh, was that some of the more recent literature, uh, including a journal which I do not read regularly called the Journal of Environmental Management, uh, very recently have had a number of articles that have talked about what the layperson brings to the table, to the Conservation Commission, to town government, with regard to the importance of decisions that are being made with regard to applications and determinations. And what it emphasized was that aesthetics of wetlands and the ecosystem that surrounds the wetlands are of extraordinary importance to the citizenry of towns because they live in and amongst those wetlands. I was also surprised to learn that the state of Vermont actually uses environmental aesthetics in their definition of what they consider constitutes significant wetlands. So I was wondering uh, what harm would be served since it seems to me that citizens that come to the Conservation Committee with aesthetic concerns about applications that are being uh, proposed, uh, the committee would most likely listen to them and perhaps even take their concerns under advisement. The other uh, question I had uh, was, and I think you also alluded to this, I believe it was 181.5 actually said that the duration of an approval for a permit or application uh, would be one year, but 181.7, I believe, said it would be three years. So there was a discrepancy between those two. The decision was made to change both to one year. I'm sorry, to three years. And what concerned me was that because, as, as you know, uh, ecosystems and wetlands and environmental systems are dynamic systems that can change very rapidly from season to season, and sometimes within a single year, why wouldn't our oversight want to be more restrictive in terms of giving one year rather than three years? So the other solution, of course, would have been to change them both to one year rather than change them both to three years. So that was just a question I had, and I appreciate your, your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Wagner? Thank you. Both very good questions. Regarding the aesthetics, we're simply following the recommendations of the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions. So in terms of wording about judgments, um, but obviously aesthetics comes into play. Um, but, um, it, but there is not a definition in Massachusetts of what is aesthetically pre pleasing. I always use the example, I'm from Kansas, and to see a lot of trees was aesthetically very pleasing when you're in Kansas, but he here sometimes to see a big open field is aesthetically pleasing. So rather than try and define it at one point in time, what they're recommending, at least in Massachusetts, is that it not be used in the bylaws. Um, and so, an answer. And in terms of the three and the one, that was probably a Scrivener's error. The State um, Protection Act actually specifies three. So, um, we, there was no choice with that. Thank you, Mrs. Feigner. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, you bring him a microphone. Since the question was raised, um, I'm just curious if we could ask town council if there is indeed any case law that even supports a determination of aesthetics. Okay, Mr. Clark, uh, Mr. Leahy. Um, Bill Leahy, town council. Um, Bill Leahy, Town Council. Um, well, the, the, 
aesthetics are used in some environmental and, and um, historic preservation um, requirements at, at the state and federal level, but I don't, I'm, I'm almost certain it's not in the f State Wetland Protection Act, and what we're talking about here is, is just, you know, what, what a particular bylaw says. So I'm not aware of a local bylaw in Massachusetts that uses the term aesthetics for wetland protection in any case law that's interpreted in that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leahy. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, this is a majority vote. Uh, and again, if, uh, no further discussion. I'll ask all those in favor to please say hi. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 13 uh, is to raise and appropriate $25,000 for the conservation fund. Mrs. Gurnard. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $25,000 for the conservation fund to be used by the Conservation Commission for any purpose authorized by Chapter 40, Section 8C of the Massachusetts General Laws. Thank you, Mrs. Gurney. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Merrill has seconded. Motion has been made um, <coughs> to appropriate the sum of $25,000 for the Conservation Fund. Uh, Mrs. Faulkner? Thank you. I'm still Kate Faulkner, 55 Haven Street. Um, so the goal of this, um, the goal of this article is to replenish the Town of Dover Conservation Fund, which is legally established by the blah blah of the general laws. Um, but from 1980s to 2014, the fund um, has been maintained at somewhere between 50,000 and 150,000 through monies raised and appropriated at town meetings. Um, 215,000 dollars was raised and appropriated through town meeting articles from 1994 to 2001, generally in, two th in $25,000 a year increments. And the Conservation Commission stopped asking for this and it stopped being funded when land prices shot up and it felt that there was just no hope of keeping up with um, the monies that would be necessary to acquire land. Our thank you. Um, however, we have found that there have been several times in recent Dover history, including a time this year, where that por portions of that fund have been used to acquire um, parcels of land to be, and this is the definition, retained for conservation and passive recreation use. If you go to the next slide, there are three examples that we give, and not to go into great detail, but they give, they show you how we were able to use small amounts of money to really um, leverage um, that fund to work with a partner in um, uh, getting something for the town that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. So in 1997, there was 100 Center Street, in 2000, Wildwood, and in 2013, just <coughs> last year, the Brody property on Dedham Street. So in both the cases of Center Street and the Brody property and Wildwood, the monies for the conservation fund really provided a placeholder to organize other people around in order to come up with a package deal. If you go to the next, the next spot, for instance, the Fullerton land, that's seven acres, it's off Center Street. The Trust for Public Lands actually got involved with that and they were the group that uh, were able to provide the majority of funds until the funds could be raised um, from uh, different sources. And the Brody property, the same way. The Conservation Commission was able to donate some of that money, but, but then it was, um, much of it was given by either the land trust or by private donors. So um, it's not enough to buy, but it's enough to start a process and get others on board. Unfortunately, the current situation is that we've now got $27 in the fund, <laughs> and that is not going to be enough. <laughs> so what we would like is to come to the town and find out whether you're interested in getting us back to that about 150000 which has stood us in good stead for the past 
20 odd years. Um, so we come before you tonight to get a feeling for the citizens from the citizens of Dover, whether you'd like to start with a $25,000. Our ultimate goal is to get back to 150,000. Um, but 25000 to start just to see if you feel, as we do, that it's important to be able to act quickly and provide the seed uh, around with others can contribute um, on critical pieces of property. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Faulkner. Uh, this is a majority vote. Any questions or discussion? Yes. I'm Jean McDonald from Main Street, and um, I've supported the Conservation Commission and uh, admired their purchases of land. I am concerned that some of the land is not being maintained very well. In particular, there's a beautiful parcel on the corner of Main Street and Haven Street, which was purchased a long time ago to preserve a vista. And that has all overgrown. Um, it was briefly cleared back when Kathy Weld was uh, on one of the selectmen and she got some uh, prisoner, I believe, workers to do it. My question is, can this, can this $25,000 be used to maintain some of the lands that we already have and that have fallen into a, a state that's not as nice as it was when we purchased them? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mrs. McDonald. Mrs. Mrs. Fagner? Uh, thank you. This land, uh, this money could not be used for that. It's for acquisition. However, we do have another fund, and we have been uh, working closely this past year to develop a maintenance project in conjunction with the Open Space Committee. So one of our other projects was to do just that, and hopefully we'll be moving forward um, with other citizens and try and get to some of the deferred maintenance. This is for acquisition, however. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, motion has been made in second to appropriate $25,000 for the conservation fund. This is a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> Article 14, uh, borrowing by the Dover Sherman Regional School District. Mrs. Gilbody. Mr. Moderator, I move that this article be dismissed. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made to dismiss Article 14 and has been seconded by Mrs. Gernard. Any discussion? All those in favor of uh, voting to dismiss, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. unanimously. Article 15, Capital Equipment Impro and Improvement. Mrs. Gernard. Mr. Moderator. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $171,455 by transfer from free cash to be expended by the dover Sherburn Regional School Committee pursuant to an intergovernmental agreement entered into by the town of Dover on February 16, 2014 with the dover Sherburn Regional School <coughs> District and the town of Sherburn for the purpose of paying Dover's allocated costs of the following capital equipment and improvements multi-purpose grounds vehicle, 25,900. Mowers, 12,700. Truck, 35,000. Sander, 5,500. Auto sampling units, 7,313. Exterior common doors, 22,000. Service doors, 7,450. Exterior walls, wood board and batten, 1,083, service doors exterior, 12,000, floors, office, and storage, 2,678, men's and women's re restrooms, 18,849, floors, lounge, 6,859, floors, lobby, 32,250, floors, lounge, 12,150, Walls and Ceilings Library, 19,119. Walls and Ceilings Gymnasium, 24,855. Lighting Upgrades, 23,175. Walls and Ceilings Restrooms, Lockers, Gymnasium, 13,519. 
team room, locker room, 20,600. Replace concrete section in front of high school main entrance, 12,000. Total, $315,000, including the payment of all costs incidental and related hereto. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, a motion has been made and second to appropriate $171,454.50 for capital improvements for the high school. Mrs. Lisbon? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Board of Selectmen, along with the Capital Budget Committee, has worked very closely with the Regional School Committee on their request for $315,000, which equates to $171,454.50, as Dover's share, to fund the necessary capital projects at the regional campus. We, recommend, we commend them on their analytical approach and their multi-year planning. In addition, there are two new aspects to the region's annual request for capital expenditures. Due to the well over million dollars projected over the next 10 years for capital budget needs for the region, the Board of Selectmen and the Capital Budget Committee have worked with the Superintendent of Schools and the Regional School Committee to develop a new process for reviewing the region's needs. The region's specific needs will be reviewed by the Dover Board of Selectmen, Dover Capital Budget Committee, and Dover Warren Committee each fall with input and guidance provided to the Regional School Committee. The second, on the, over the past four years, the Board of Selectmen has requested from Sherburn an intergovernmental agreement which would allow each town to fund the regional school's capital requests as they wish. For example, one town may pay for it from available <coughs> free cash, as we are suggesting, while the other town could seek to borrow funds to pay for it, as Sherburn recently voted at their town meeting. The Board would like to thank Sherburn Board of Selectmen Chair Peter Caruso Superintendent of Schools Steve Bliss and the Regional School Committee for the leadership and support in obtaining Sherburn's approval of the agreement this past winter. While the agreement is only for one year, we hope and expect that annual renewals will allow Dover the flexibility to fund the region's capital needs in the manner best for Dover in any given year. You will notice that in this article, the Town of Dover youth seeks to use available free cash to fund the region's request. The Board of Selectmen supports this article and asks for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lisbon. Any further discussion? Mrs. White. Thank you. Uh, Dana White, uh, 158 Farm Street, and Vice Chair of the Regional School Committee. We thought that since uh, we were embarking on the new process, as Mrs. Lisbon said, that it would be smart to take a few minutes just to explain to you what that process looks like, because we plan to come back uh, every year with a little bit of a different request and this will hopefully set the stage for a smooth process over the next few years. Just to remind people of the history, in 2003 we embarked between the two towns on a $40 million project uh, on, at the regional campus and that included a major renovation to the high school, the athletic fields, a brand new middle school, shared facilities such as the wastewater treatment facility, a major upgrade to the room that you're sitting in thanks to in part with the Mudge Foundation and all of the projects that were associated with that. We then enjoyed collectively basically a 10 year honeymoon period. Very limited maintenance requests, very small up upgrades. Now we've hit 2014 and when we look forward from that, we wanna make sure that we're doing things in a, in a way that's going to maintain these buildings in the manner in which that we as the two towns would like to see them. We wanna make sure that we're never in a position that we've deferred maintenance so much as to make the buildings um, cost a great deal to, to bring up to speed. We had an opportunity last year to address an issue that was not done during the 2003 renovation, which was to put the air conditioning in the middle school. And thanks to the taxpayers of both towns, we did pass that project and it has been installed and is working magnificently in the middle school. And I think the teachers and the students would both thank the, the townspeople for the, that project. We wanna be able to leverage new technologies such as the lighting upgrades and to work with NSTAR and to figure out how to pay for those, hopefully. And also, but most importantly, to create a capital budget process that we can live with. Fundamental to that process is that we're moving from a one-year window to more of a five to 10-year look at our capital projects. In 2012, we commissioned an outside agency, Onsite Insight, to go through hundreds of potential projects in the, in the regional campus. Every asset was looked at to determine when the end of useful life might be, what, how much it might cost to, um, to bring that, to, in, to uh, renovate that place, 
part and to make sure that we knew exactly when that should happen. So on an annual basis, we sit down with the, the administration within Dover Sherburn, with Ralph Kelly, the director of facilities, and Chris Tagg, the business manager, and really look at each of those dates. So is the project still on track? Should it be pushed back? Should it be moved up? Are there projects that should be lumped together in order to identify economies of scale? Is there anything that should be placed on that list that hasn't been there before? And to make sure that the costs that were in the original plan are actually accurate in this year. Uh, we bring all that together. We also obviously look at what we've asked for in the past to make sure that we're doing the right things with the money that we've been given already. And together with all of that information, develop the warrant that you see in front of you. We then, as Mrs. Lisbon alluded to, sit down with pretty much every committee in both towns to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what we're requesting for capital and then bring forward the warrant that you see. Um, <coughs> Mrs. Gerner listed the 20 different projects that make up the $315,000 capital request for this year. I'd be happy to go through any of them, but um, we, uh, we have details on all of those and our share of that is $171,000. $454. Uh, to give you a sense of what it's going to look like over the next five years, we're looking at an average request of about $365,000 annually. Um, right now, those projects are sitting as the numbers you see up there, ranging from a low of $230,000 in fiscal 18 to a high of fiscal 16 of $432,000. Obviously, some of these might change, some of the numbers might change, but it gives you a sense of what we're looking at. What we like to think of it as is it's basically less than 1% of our asset cost. And I think all of us who own homes would be pretty happy if our renovation and upgrade costs only cost 1% of our asset value in a given year. So I think we're doing pretty well on that. Uh, we have looked out as far as 10 years, as, as I said, there are some big projects coming down the road out in 2020, 23, and 25 around HVAC systems and roofs. Obviously, um, we will do a lot of work with the different boards in town to make sure that we're addressing those and financing them appropriately, and everybody knows what's going to be coming down the pike. Uh, the caveat there, obviously, is that things might change, but we'd be certainly uh, updating everybody annually on what, what will be accurate for that year. So I hope that gives you a sense of what, what the uh, 315000 and what our share of it entails for this year. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Mrs. White. Thank you very much. So we have a motion uh, to raise and appropriate $171,455 for capital improvements. Any further discussion? This is a majority vote. Uh, Mr. Crowley. Tom Crowley, Cedar Hill. Could you tell us if Sher Sherman's had their town meeting, did they appropriate their share? Yes, they did. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, this is a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 16, amendment to the existing agreement for the Minuteman Regional Vocational School District. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator, I move that this article be dismissed. So I hear a second. Second. Okay, Mr. Lawrence has seconded a motion to dismiss. I'd like to now call upon the Chair of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Dolly. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 16 is the special interest of the Board of Selectmen. The town of Dover is currently one of 16 member communities that belong to the Minuteman Vocational School District. Minuteman has identified the need to either significantly renovate or construct a new school building. The current agreement gives each member town one vote, regardless of their student enrollment which does not lend itself to approval of Minuteman's future needs. For several years, the Minuteman School Committee has been working with member towns to amend the agreement, but the proposal put forth to the selectmen to date is incomplete and contains numerous assumptions on other member communities in the Commonwealth's actions. In addition, the proposed amendment severely penalizes Dover in the allocation of capital expenditures. The Board of Selectmen cannot recommend approval of the, this proposed amendment at this time as we do not have all the information and guarantees we need. The Board of Selectmen will be notifying the Minuteman School Committee of our specific needs and conditions to ensure that Dover's financial concerns are addressed and that our students continue to have the opportunity to attend the school. We, therefore, 
recommend dismissing this article and expect that we will bring this uh, issue back at a future town meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolly. Any further discussion on this motion to dismiss? This is a majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 17, Amendment to the Zoning Bylaw in regard to medical marijuana facilities. Mr. Forte. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town amend Chapter 185 of the Zoning Bylaws of the Town of Dover by one, deleting in its entirety Section 185-10-1, Moratorium on Medical Marijuana Treatment Centers. Two, deleting the definition of medical marijuana treatment center in Section 185.5. Three, adding a new section, 185-46.2, special requirements for medical marijuana facilities, as shown in Exhibit 1 of the Planning Board Report, copies of which have been placed on file with the town clerk and made available as handouts at town meeting. And four, deleting in section 185-10, item 35, the letter X, and replacing it with the letter P, under the columns labeled M, P, and B, and adding the letters S, P under the column labeled Site Plan. And further, that non substantive changes to the numbering of this bylaw are authorized in order to make numbering conform to the numbering format of the Code of the Town of Dover. Thank you, Mr. Forte. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Motion has been made to amend the zoning bylaw pertaining to mar medical marijuana treatment facilities. This requires a two-thirds vote, and state law also requires that the planning board uh, present their report to town meeting. If I could call upon the chair of the planning board, Mark Saro. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mark Saro on Colonial Road and planning board chair. Uh, the Planning Board thinks this is a, a fairly straightforward article, but I do want to explain a bit about it uh, since it's a relatively unique issue. Uh, this article is actually a follow-up to Article 18 at last year's annual town meeting. Uh, last year we voted to prohibit medical marijuana facilities in town uh, for one year in order to give the Planning Board time to draft this bylaw. Again, the Attorney General ruled that towns can't ban these facilities outright. The Town of Wakefield tried that and it got its bylaw rejected. So with a one-year ban in place, the planning board set out to draft a zoning bylaw that would be consistent with state regulations as well as being in the best interest of the town. So this bylaw gives the town local control over the approval process, the location, the size, and the ongoing monitoring of any such facilities in Dover. And these are things that the state statute doesn't actually contemplate. It contemplates that towns like Dover will actually do this for ourselves. The resulting bylaw seems straightforward on the surface, um, but it's very detailed, and it is the result of a year of, of pretty careful thinking and discussion. Um, it was discussed at several planning board meetings. It was discussed at the Warren Committee open hearing. Uh, the planning board held a public hearing of our own on the, on the article as well. Uh, we had the benefit of wide-ranging input from uh, Dover residents, from the selectmen, from the Warren Committee, the chief of police, from SPAN-DS, which is the Substance Prevention and Awareness Network of dover Sherburn as well as town council. And so on behalf of the board, I want to thank all those who participated in that process. Very briefly, um, I know there are copies of, of the bylaw here and they've been posted on the website and such as well. Uh, the state law that took effect in January 2013 <coughs> initially allows up to 35 uh, what are called registered uh, med marijuana dispensaries in the state. And there, it allows a maximum of five such RMDs in each county. An RMD can grow, sell, or both uh, medical marijuana. So an initial application round ended in January. There are 100 applications statewide. Um, I'm sorry, there are 180 applications statewide. 100 of them were deemed eligible after an initial review by the Department of Public Health. Um, among those, none were proposed for Dover, and none were proposed for any other town with a population of less than 10,000. We're now in the verification round at the state level. In February, the Department of Public Health approved uh, 20 provisional licenses, so those are the first approvals of these applications. There are two in Norfolk County. One is in Brookline and one is in Quincy. So they're cities, not towns, and cities that are very different from Dover. Uh, and those have to be, and any RMD, would have to be fully certified by the state, um, approved at the local level as well, 
before going fully operational. So again, local approval is the final hurdle for one of these um, facilities to be sited in, a, in any town. Uh, with so many more applications than available licenses, and with none for Dover or, or a town like us, uh, the Planning Board doesn't expect this bylaw to actually be used in the foreseeable future. Um, in fact, the verification phase would have re required that we would have been notified if there were an application that had received provisional approval at the state level, and actually one of the conditions for the approval would have been that the, uh, the town that it shows some sort of town support. So we would have had the ability to comment on, on the application as a town. Of course, that, that hasn't happened. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, uh, the bylaw itself um, isn't needed. In, in general, as, as with every other uh, part of the zoning bylaw, having local controls in place uh, is very important. Uh, the state touts that Massachusetts regulations are among the strictest in the country on medical marijuana. Uh, there are uh, background checks and, and checks of the financial strengths of the applicants. Only nonprofit entities are eligible for licenses. Um, most growing activity has to be done within a building because under the state statute it's required to be in designated locked limited areas that are under um, 24 hour surveillance by cameras. Um, so they can't be, for example, in very large open fields. Um, and there are strict security standards in addition to that. Um, and these facilities have to get a new registration with the state every year. But still, on, on top of that, there's no substitute for strong local control. Um, and so the planning board uh, crafted this bylaw uh, to allow, to the extent we can, local control over any of these facilities that in the future might be proposed for the town, even though there's none on the table now. So to summarize, um, the key provisions of the bylaw are that it require a special permit from the planning board um, in order for a site to be um, permitted here in Dover. This is a higher hurdle than most things that come before the board. It, it's a process that requires four of the five votes of the board, not just a simple majority. Uh, special permits also aren't transferable under the bylaw, so if ownership changes uh, of a facility, the, owners would, the new owners would have to come back to the planning board um, and a special permit would have to be extended to them. Uh, these, the bylaw also restricts any uh, dispensaries to uh, a limited number of designated locations within the town. Specifically, it restricts the locations to the business and medical professional districts that are in the center of town. And so that means that one of these facilities could not be located in the residential districts, which are the majority of town or anywhere else in Dover other than one of those two designated districts. And uh, we have a map, just to make clear for everyone since you may not know where those districts are, that just show where these areas are in town. So this is a, this is a, um, a snapshot of the center of town. The, the red building in the center is, uh, is Town Hall, just, for, just to get your bearings. Uh, you can see Walpole Street, Dedham Street, Center Street, Whiting Road marked out. So the areas that are in gray, are residential areas or our official or open space districts. They're in gray because these are areas that under the proposed bylaw, uh, a registered marijuana facility could not be cited. The only areas in which uh, an RMD could be located are in the white areas, which are portion, which are the medical and the medical districts, uh, which is the, the one parcel over on the left hand side, and then the business districts uh, which are the white parcels in the center and to the right. Uh, you can see that in addition to limiting RMDs to be cited in those particular districts of town and nowhere else, the bylaws it's proposed also requires a 200 foot setback from any place where children would congregate frequently. And so that setback's denoted by the green line on that slide. Uh, and it rules out much of the business district on the right hand side and it rules out parts of the business district uh, in the center as well. Uh, the yellow line that's there is a 250 foot buffer just for reference so that you can see part of the decision making of the planning board that went into this um, in terms of how restrictive would, would still be uh, a reasonable bylaw for the town to minimize the likelihood that the bylaw would be challenged or would not be approved um, by the attorney general. Uh, and since so much of the permissible district would have been excluded uh, beyond the 200 foot setback. That's what the bylaw currently proposes. Uh, in addition to the location and the setback provision, 
the bylaw limits uh, RMDs to be of a uh, certain size. There's a 1,000 square foot size minimum and a 6,000 square foot maximum size. These are just based on the current configuration of buildings that are in those districts right now. And it, and it would keep any such facility in keeping with the buildings that are there now. Of course, those buildings could change going forward. Um, it also restricts the hours of such a facility to be consistent with the hours of the businesses that are currently in the, in the business district. And the bylaw importantly requires an ongoing monitoring of any such facility. Uh, it includes disclosure of the names of all of the owners of the facilities and the managers of any such facility, including any, all the way down to the level of anyone who has a key. We would have to have the name. And those names would be reported to the police, to the building inspector, as well as to the planning board. We would also receive an annual report of any such um, facility. That annual report would go to both the town clerk and the planning board. And then once per year, in January of each year, um, the owners of the facility would have to come in and meet with the planning board. Um, also, uh, just as an FYI at its town meeting last week, Sherburn unanimously approved its version of a similar bylaw. And uh, again, uh, we've worked really hard over the last year, quite deliberately, deliberately to get this right um, and to put in place a strong process for local oversight of this in the town. Um, having this bylaw is in the best interest of the town and uh, planning board thinks it deserves our support. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Thank you. Uh, this is a two thirds vote. Any further discussion or questions? Yes, Mr. Clark. Uh, Mr. Repetti, I would uh, move the question and ask that the moderator a uh, request that the body vote by acclamation so as to ensure that we not be belabored by a lengthy count. Okay. Um, I suspect we're going to get a two-thirds vote, Mr. Clark, but you've moved the question. Uh, that requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, could I have a second for the motion that we move the question? Okay, motion uh, has been seconded. Any, uh, I'm sorry, all those in favor, uh, this is non-debatable, all those in favor of moving the question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, now I heard one no. Uh, motion carries. Now let's move to a consideration of the motion itself. Again, we cannot have any further debate since the motion has been moved. Uh, this is to approve the zoning bylaw change for the medical marijuana facilities. It is a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to the next article, Article 18, creation of a reserve fund. Uh, Mr. Stewart? Mr. Moderator. I move that the sum of $250,000 be appropriated for a reserve fund for fiscal year 2015 to provide for extraordinary or unforeseen expenditures pursuant to Chapter 40, Section 6 of the Massachusetts General Laws, and that to meet this appropriation, $200,000 be raised and $50,000 be transferred from the overlay surplus. Do I hear? Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Do I hear a second? Second. Mrs. Gilbarney has second. Motion has been made. Uh, that $250,000 be appropriate for a reserve fund. Any discussion? This is a majority vote. Okay, no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries unanimously. We're almost there. <laughs> article 19, unpaid bills. Mr. Merrill. Mr. Moderator, I move that this article be dismissed. Second? Second. Mr. Merrill has made the motion to dismiss. Mr. Cox has seconded. This is a majority vote. Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 20, supplemental appropriations. Mr. Uh, Mrs. Gilbody. Mr. Moderator, I move that the sum of $44,216 be appropriated by transfer from free cash to, ac to account number 601, Dover Sherbin Regional Schools to pay Dover's operating fiscal year 14 assessment to the Dover Sherbin Regional Schools to cover unanticipated expenses under Article 4 of the warrant for the 2013 annual town meeting to be expended in the current fiscal year. 
Thank you, Ms. Gilbody. Do I hear a second? Second. Mrs. Gernon has seconded. Uh, this is a motion for supplemental appropriations. It's a majority <laughs> vote. Any discussion? Uh, no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 21, free cash. Mrs. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town transfer from pre free cash the sum of $1,301,680 to meet the appropriations for fiscal year 2015 and that the Board of Assessors be authorized to use the same amount to reduce the tax rate for fiscal year 2015. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Merrill has seconded. This is a majority vote. Any discussion? Okay, no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 22, the Town of Dover Stabilization Fund. Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Moderator, I move that this article be dismissed. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion has been made to dismiss Article 22. Any discussion? This is a majority vote. All in, those, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. This last motion is not debatable. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator, I move that this meeting be dissolved. Thank well, you, Mr. Cohn. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, one, one second, Mr. Petty. Uh, one second. I, I don't know the logistics of how we can um, go back to that free cash question, please. Mm -hmm. Where did the number come from? Where did the number? We're trying to... Oh, you want to check on the number, Article 21? Yes, please. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, Mr. Stewart? <laughs> that number... That number is, um, is calculated uh, based on the... Um, if you look at the, in the blue book, the spreadsheet, the use of, uh, of free cash um, for the entire evening, and then... Uh, because we've already allocated from free cash based on certain articles, um, Article 15, 171, 455, and Article 20, 44,216. Oh, okay. Thank you. That will net out to the total amount that was, that's in the blue book. So it's, it's because of prior allocations during this meeting. Um, uh, it all sums to that total 1517351000 that's in the blue book, as there have been no changes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, now for the uh, final motion. Um, Mr. Cohen made a motion. Uh, did I hear a second? Second. Mr. Stewart made a second. Motion has been made to dissolve the meeting. Thank you very much. This is non-debatable. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you.